This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10, a very good morning to you. Um, I, 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 I don't know quite what the word is. A heads up, I suppose, that we will, of course, be observing a two-minute silence at 11 o'clock today. So don't be, don't be alarmed. Um, if, if I, I can't really speak to people who've just tuned in, can I, and found themselves stumbling unexpectedly into a two-minute silence. But, but you understand why I'm giving you uh, a, a little bit of an early um, uh, reminder that we will be doing that. Yeah, quite powerful images coming in from Paris. Did you know that Starmer was the first Prime Minister since Churchill to attend the armistice in France? It's not Thursday. I hope that doesn't come as a major shock to anybody. I mention it because it's not mystery hour, but that's precisely the sort of question that I'd normally file away on a Monday and think, oh, I must ask that on Thursday during mystery hour and then completely forget. That, that's just odd. Is that just sort of calendar related? Is is it, or, or is it, I mean, that seems significant. I just saw footage of, of Starmer and Macron uh, at, a, at a statue of, of Churchill. That um, I think it was Churchill. And it was in silhouette on the... But it was it, it was very powerful. An important day. Um, I, this is not the kind of uh, media outlet where we'll be devoting any time whatsoever to trying to tell you what poppies you can and can't wear. Uh, it's hard to think of anything more ironic than commemorating sacrifice at the altar of freedom and peace by trying to bully people and denigrate people for whatever choices they choose to make in that space. We may instead talk a little later in the programme about where that comes from, that desire from people who claim to be patriotic to use patriotism as a weapon with which to beat other people when it should, of course, be an invitation to enjoy a warm embrace. But I don't know. We've got a, we've got a lot going on. Five minutes after ten is the time. There's something a bit weird going on. All right. I'm, I'm talking about my own personal relationship with the political landscape as opposed to anything, anything broader. And I, I, I'll tell you what it is. It's, uh, I've got echoes of every single time in my life. And I, I've been doing this job quite a long time now. So it's going to be uh, uh, chiefly concerning the, the years in which I have been doing this job rather than uh, uh, prior to that. But every single time in my life, I remember warnings that businesses or, or, or even individuals, but, but chiefly businesses, whether you've got a, a button factory or a farm, can't afford whatever it is that the government is intending to introduce. There's, there's two soul says, I thank you for your concern, mate. I think I'll be able to do two minutes without speaking, but you just stay tuned at 11 o'clock to find out whether or not I do struggle to stay silent. There's two quotes that I've heard from politicians in the last week that I think are really interesting. One was Damien Hines and one was Darren Jones. And I think they were both on LBC. Damien was on Ian Dale's most excellent crosstalk programme. And he conceded that they'd got that wrong. I think it may have been Jeremy Corbyn who, who quizzed this. You get a great calibre of guests on crosstalk. Uh, it, it, Jeremy Corbyn was quizzing him on a cross-question, sorry, not crosstalk, of course, was quizzing him on the warnings, the apocalyptic warnings that accompanied intention to, or, or uh, yeah, intention to introduce minimum wage legislation, which I presume was under the last Labour government, was it? That was post-97, pre-2010. And everybody, everybody involved in business or even vaguely adjacent to the Tory party was absolutely adamant that it was going to cripple business. It was going to cripple commerce. GlaxoSmithKline was going to disappear under the, under the, under the swell of the North Sea. Uh, Dyson would probably have left the country, which, of course, he did subsequently. But, uh, you, I mean, pubs were going to be closing at a rate of knots. Pubs have actually closed at a rate of knots, but not as a consequence of minimum wage legislation. It's a consequence of very cheap booze in supermarkets. And supermarkets were going to have to shut up shop because they couldn't afford... We can't afford minimum wage. You turn on your radio... And you hear people insisting that they can't afford it. It's outrageous. Anti-business. We just can't do it. A minimum wage. And I'd say, like, yeah. And then idiots like me would tell the story about the bloke who takes one of his employees out into the car park and shows him a Porsche, a brand new Porsche. And his employee goes, oh, that's lovely, that is, boss. Oh, oh, that's gorgeous. And his boss says to him, do you know what? If you work very hard all year... I'll be able to buy another one of them next year. And, and you sort of realise that quite often the people that are telling you they can't afford to pay minimum wage are defending a system under which they just get to keep even more of the money. 
I know what you're thinking. What's strange about this, James? It's like a stuck record. You pursue political points like this one on a daily basis. Yes, but I haven't finished. A little bit of patience goes a long, long way. Because when it comes to farming and hospitality, which are the two key areas, I think, that I am being told to care about, I'm being told to be concerned about when it comes to warnings of imminent disaster and and actually care homes today as well but care homes are are, are another area that that confuse the rest of us because some enormous fortunes are being made while at the same time some people are are struggling to keep their uh, facilities open i i am being told particularly to care about farming and hospitality and Some of the people telling me to care about farming and hospitality are people that I would routinely trust. They are not people that would necessarily... And this is where I've got a problem. This is where it's a little bit... um a little bit new for me. They're not people who would necessarily be queuing up to condemn any policy that was designed to see the transfer or to put a little bit more of a burden upon wealth, upon the owning class when it comes to looking after the country that creates not only their workforce but their customer base all right so lbc is a business all right we have a workforce and we have a customer base so the 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 idea of corporation tax or an increase in national insurance is designed to make the business take up a little bit more of the slack in pursuit of improving the country for both workforce and customer base. Uh, but a business is, of course, people, but not in quite the same sense that your mum is a person or, indeed, I am a person. So what's the second political quote that um, caught my eye or caught my ear? That, that was Darren Jones, uh, I think, actually, possibly on the Beeb, explaining that Making the NHS better, getting the NHS sorted, would actually be brilliant news for all the employers. Getting the NHS on its feet is something retailers will benefit from, and these things have to be paid for. So a healthier workforce and a healthier customer base is better for business. So if you are going to cast around, if you accept the necessity of fundraising if you like, if you, if you accept the necessity of getting your mitts on a little bit more cash in order to, to, to seek to undo some of the disastrous damage done to the NHS over the course of 14 years of austerity and less predictably or less culpably by COVID, then you need to decide where it's going to come from, right? And the Labour government, perhaps clumsily, perhaps mistakenly, has decided to take it from people who... Or run businesses you see people who run businesses not necessarily from businesses which means that for the next god knows how long the daily mail will be full of stories um about businesses that are about to shut or businesses that are about to leave the country or businesses uh, newspapers that had absolutely no problem at all with dyson shifting to singapore after telling everybody else to go to to, to vote brexit will suddenly be claiming that businesses are going to have to shut and this and that and the other as a consequence of a, of a policy that is designed to raise money to improve the NHS. As opposed to Brexit, I got an idiot's corner already. I, I can't, here it is, here, I can't find it. Um, uh, it was someone called Mark saying, oh yeah, it's like all the warnings about Brexit being bad. As if anyone in 2024 can still be sitting there unaware of the utterly unnecessary damage that we've done to ourselves economically as a consequence of leaving the single market. But hey-ho, it's it's too late for him. It's not too late for the rest of us. You, You know that this is, if you like, designed to make us think it can't be afforded and therefore we all then end up being opposed to something that is designed to improve our NHS or to improve our public services. But let's take that line from Darren Jones and set it up in competition with that line from Damien Hines, former Tory minister. Damien Hines essentially admitting that we got it wrong on minimum wage. And now that's an honest mistake. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that. All of the Murdoch groupies who were claiming that businesses were going to be shut by tea time, that was not an honest mistake. That was a lie designed to protect wealth and greed, uh, fetishise it even. But you set them up against each other. Who do you trust? 13 minutes after 10 is the time. Who do you trust? 
How, how do you know who you can trust? So over the years, I've made friends with people in the farming industry and the hospitality industry. Some of the, you know, I don't really like to socialise with anyone that might end up being a story on the programme. It's, it's, it's very tricky, even to the point of, of, um, uh, of interviewing them sometimes because a story could then come along and because you've developed a, a warmth towards someone or an affection, you worry that it's going to somehow scupper your ability to be objective. But in the, in the context of doing my job or, or indeed in the context of judging a sausage roll competition at the Red Lion pub in Barnes, I have encountered people from the hospitality trade, mo- most notably the, the head of hospitality England, and I've met lovely farmers, most notably Liz in Cricklade, who rings in quite a lot, but is actually, um, well, she's one of those callers to this show who gets booked as a guest on other shows. She's quite a big cheese, a grand fromage in, in, in the world of farming. And, 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 and they are both adamant, Kate at the hospitality outfit and Liz on the farming for Britain, um, adamant that this is disastrous. And these are people that I trust. These are people that I like, albeit that their job is to defend the interests of their members and their members will be people who are being told they're going to have to find a few quid to help get the nhs back on its feet so hands up if you don't want the nhs to improve yeah exactly and now hands up if you can think of a better place to get the money from than the people who've got most of the money yep exactly but that might not mean Big Dave at the Dog and Duck, who's barely making a living as it is, and if he is required to pay extra national insurance, it could be the difference on his staff's wages. It could be the difference between surviving and not surviving. He doesn't feel he can put his his wages up. He doesn't feel he can uh, um, uh, uh, put a few pences on the price of a pint. He's already he record, and I don't know. You know, free market fetishists, the kind of people who congregate around Tufton Street, would say that that's tough. Um, that, that if you can't keep a business afloat you know, under economic, then you must go. Then you just go bust. It's survival of the fittest. Well, they wouldn't say that because, of course, they're defending wealth and claiming that you shouldn't be paying tax. But that's the thing about free market hypocrites. They're great, enormous, massive fans of the free market until, of course, it starts hurting the people whose interests they are usually anonymously paid to defend. So I want you to... T- I mean, this is the problem now. This is why I wasn't joking. When I said I only do things like this on a Monday, and sometimes by half past ten on Monday, I'm thinking, what the hell were you thinking of, you absolute flump? You've just done a phone-in show that is literally built upon the premise that no one will be able to answer the question that you're asking. But in for a penny, eh? In for a pound. Who can you trust? If you take those two points as central, they lied or, quotes, were wrong, end quotes, about minimum wage when they said businesses couldn't afford it, And they really did. I hope I don't need to remind you. I hope you can remember, even if you're just hearing vague echoes of something in your own memory. It was it was it was apocalyptic. It was nuclear strength, negativity about how how people would cope. with That's one of the first things that the Tony Blair's government brought in. I think it was in about 1998. uh, Thanks to another mark for sending that in. Not not the one in Idiot's Corner. Um, And then you've got the claims that we can't afford this and the daily mail is magnificent at the moment it really is it's just talk about a pearl clutching on a on a on an hourly basis absolutely adamant i, I think we should probably look up how much the owner of the daily mail is worth but they adamant they can't afford it. no one can afford it it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not a child and it's exactly the same it's deja vu all over again it's minimum wage 2.0 but just because The minimum wage debate was skewed and wrong and biased and dishonest and designed entirely to protect the interests of wealth by persuading the victims of excessive wealth that they were actually on the sides of excessive. Just because that was wrong doesn't mean this is wrong. Labour's NI tax rate spells ruin for British pubs and restaurants. Well, hands up who wants that? See, no one's put their hand up yet today. Everybody wants the NHS to get better. Nobody can think of a better place to get the money from than the people who've got the most money. And nobody wants Britain's pubs and restaurants to face oblivion. No one's put their hand up yet today. I've got a horrible feeling someone's going to put their hand up now. So who who can tell me? who Who do you trust? Do you wait for businesses to start closing to prove that Rachel Reeves is wrong? Do you cross your fingers and hope for the best? What do you do? How does it work? 
Ms. Reeves has increased the rate paid by employers on wages from 13.8% to 15%. She's cut the earnings threshold at which firms start paying it from 9,100 to 5,000 a year. It means that thousands of part-time staff are now included in the tax for the first time. Can I add one more element to this conversation, which I don't think ever gets talked about, and you may not even know about this. One of the strangest things that has happened in this country, in my view, over the last few years, and I do not know whether it was brought in under Labour or the Conservatives, and I do not care because I think it is disgusting, absolutely incredible, when you reflect upon how many people in full-time work or part-time work are in receipt of universal credit. So let me use, with your permission, the example of somebody working on a till in a supermarket, not because of any status or similar associated with working on a till in a supermarket, but because supermarkets routinely make absolutely enormous sums of money. So somebody working on a till in a supermarket on a low wage, on minimum wage perhaps, is recognised by the state as being in need of more money simply to maintain a basic standard of living. And that money comes out of the treasury. That money comes out of the welfare budget. That money comes out in universal credit. Who pays into universal credit? Who pays into the treasury? Who pays into welfare? We all do, via things like national insurance. But the employer can make hundreds of millions of pounds in profit while relying on the state to subsidize the income of their lowest paid staff. Now, it may well be that I'm missing something, But that has always struck me as the most scandalous anomaly in our economy. You can make make hundreds of millions of pounds as a business and rely on the state to subsidise the income of your most poorly paid staff. So that sweeping change that Rachel Reeves has introduced is designed in part to change that, to shift the onus for paying staff enough or for having enough money to pay them, even if you're going to carry on subsidising them, back to the business. So... How are we going to know? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Who can we trust on this? Would you like to pay more? Hell no. My farm's only worth five million pounds. I can't afford anything. Who who do we trust on this? Who do you trust? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. Can you trust yourself? Have you worked it out? Take those two quotes from those two politicians. We were completely wrong about minimum wage and. Everyone benefits if we improve the NHS and and businesses, retail, hospitality, farms, they will benefit the most. Who do we trust? How do we know? How do you and me know? 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 10 is the time. So it is, you're right, one of those mornings where I'm, I'm trying desperately to sort of steer a path through the ludicrously biased, even bigoted right-wing media in this country that now dedicates, dictates almost all of the national conversation. Well, not here, but sometimes I I don't know where to turn instead. So when they wanted to introduce minimum wage, they told me it was the end of the world as we know it. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. How do we know that the same is not true of all of the pearl clutching and howling about uh, either inheritance tax on farmers or more pertinently today, the national insurance on employers? Mark's in Huddersfield. Mark, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, we, we, we've got four sites currently. Um, sites? Hospitali- hospitality yes. sites, sorry. Um, and we're going to close one of them off the back of the budget. The other three were not, but one of them off the back of the budget we will we will close because of the announcements. How does that work? Just, just, just I mean, three stay open, but one's going to close. Effectively, that um, one of our sites is a lot more labour tentative. It does a lot more food uh, than the other three, yeah. um, and because of that, we've sort of to keep it viable over the years. We've we've looked at um, um, how we how we sort of to the staff. So the minimum wage increase wasn't so bad um, when it was to be over twenty five. Got the top rate. Yes. Got to twenty three, and it's up to twenty one, and we'd have a we'd have a range of staff that some had sort of at eighteen, they'd come and start working for us, move up to another band and another band and another band. That has as have a and you get a bit of turnover in hospitality, and then you have a a, a really good range, to be honest, you have. 
some in the 30s, some in the mid-20s, some in the teens. The way that the, the minimum wages move now instead, so that... So, so the, the top, teenagers, the, come come April next year, the, the ones you've got who are under 18, you're going to have to pay them £7.55 an hour. Um, the I think it's the next band that's the, the bigger one. So you're going to have the, to pay the, them £10 an hour. And that gap is sort of an 18%, 16%, 17% rise, I think, compared to the 6% rise from the other side. Yeah. And... But £10, still, ten pounds an hour for a 20-year-old doesn't, doesn't... I mean, I, you know, if I was a right-winger and, and this was a slightly different conversation about what people can and can't afford, I'd, I'd be telling you either that you're not running your business very well or you should cancel your Netflix subscription. If you can't afford to pay your staff £10 an hour, then you're doing something wrong. I'm not saying that is what I believe. I'm just reminding you that if the rhetoric were reversed, that is the kind of line that you'd now be hearing. And you'd probably get it from, from me, James. I, I generally believe in, you know, survival of the fittest, and three of mine will survive. But one on one, and it was the budget. It wasn't just the NI. The, okay. the, big, the, the big hit was the, um, the business rates, the 75% down to 40%. It's another really big hit for us. But that was true before COVID, wasn't it? It's just being put back to where it was before. Um, yes, but obviously, business, not so. So again, again, since no. Well, I, I take your COVID, point, but but again, it was put in place as a, as, as to a literally help you get through COVID. Uh, no one else is is getting help with COVID related um, oh, no, benefits no, I, anymore. I, 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 Completely under, uh, understand, and like I said, three of our sites are, uh, uh, will be, will be will sort of take the the hit, and will sort of increase prices accordingly and you know we'll sort of when are you closing bat, bat on um we'll probably look at in the new year we'll get christmas out of the way which will be a, a reasonable trading period for us and then it'll be probably early in january and and are you hoping that there might I mean the budget's the budget isn't it they're not going to change any of this stuff although i think the farmers marching next week pretty confident they won't be treated with the same approach that uh, the British media takes to just stop oil protesters despite no doubt deploying similar tactics you're not you're not optimistic that they might change something not not to not to the point that's going to um going to help i think that the 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 are talking about a business rates reform in i think 25 or 26 maybe that may that you know it'd help but nothing Come immediate back again. it'll be too late for you then this is a cheeky question but it's not mine ian wants to know what car you drive <laughs> i have a very nice one well can you tell us what it is Volvo uh, XC90. Okay, and what does that retail for? Uh, this is only Ian that's asking this, not me. I'm not. I'm, I'm not that nosy. I don't really understand the point of the question. But how much does that go for retail? Um, a used one on my year, uh, probably about forty grand. Okay, and how much is it again that you'd have to pay the nineteen-year-olds? Uh, seven, seven something or that you know i see it from the other side james i've got my i, my I know you do and i'm very grateful to you for being such a good sport and, and i didn't I, I mean ian's very cheeky no, I, I, asking that question yeah, I, but you understand why he did and i've got a partner that's got sort of quite bad health issues so i, I will so, so you want the nhs increases. to get more money then Oh, absolutely yes. and and i want the and i'd like schools to have more more money as well you know i i see how how they struggle and Thank and you. so it's it, it's very it's very balanced and, and it's I think very it's balanced. nuanced and it and it's complex and i hope your business does survive i hope i hope if you crunch the numbers you can see it or christmas is so amazing you can stay afloat for a bit longer and turn the corner i don't know i really do but i want to thank you even in the light of ian's disgusting question ian frankly back of the class for you that's outrageously uh, rude and nosy of you but thank you for letting me have a conversation that is actually quite illuminating and helpful um, because it's so easy not to be, isn't it, for, for some of the reasons that we've touched on in the past. And I wish you well. Do you want to give the pubs a shout? Sure, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, much, well, you don't now, do you? Sorry, that's all Ian's fault. But it's a good job you didn't do so before. Mark, state mind, there you go. It's coming up to half past ten. I don't know. I could almost do an hour on Is Ian's Question Fair? I'm going to have to close because I can't afford to pay teenagers 20, 20, £10 an hour. I go back to that flipping... 
car park analogy that I opened the show with, aren't we? If you work hard all this year, I'll be able to buy another one next year. It's half past ten. Jenny Barsby has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.32 is the time. I have worked, right, uh, Brennan, for many companies. Every year they say we need to reduce staff due to budgets or taxes and the current staff end up doing more work for less money. But they seem to forget that with our staff, they will make, that with no staff, they'll make no profit. It's time to support staff. I get deducted a 20-minute break to literally have a coffee whilst I make them money. In 1997, I worked for a supermarket and we had an hour's paid break. We were supplied food and we got shares in the company and a discount card. I now work for another supermarket chain and I get a discount card to spend in their shop. I, I think that's the boiling frog analogy. I think that the relationship between employer and employee in the course of my lifetime has changed beyond recognition. The commoditization, well, not even the commoditization, but, but you, you know, staff loyalty. I don't think is particularly valued. Most people don't feel that the company that they work for prioritizes their welfare or, or looks after them they are just means by which more money could be made so that's why in the in the news bulletin there you had a massive company announcing it's going to make savings um and i wonder what their profits are so so what what is the point of making savings you you, you know you can't have a workforce doing nothing even if the company is profitable just because it's a sort of act of social altruism an act of social goodness but equally you can't go back to the days of, of is it a Dutch auction where, where people are just queuing up looking for a day's work and whoever offers to do it for the least will get the shift. And that's within living memory in some parts of this country. Somewhere between the two lies a balance. And whether or not the Labour Party have found that balance, only time will tell. But who do we trust in the meantime? Who can we trust in the meantime? 0345 6060 is the number that you need um and apparently well i very split feelings on whether or not that question about our last caller's car was fair i think it was i don't think i can sit here and say it was unfair while i opened with that old um canard about the boss taking his employee out into the car park showing him his brand new uh volvo x90 and and telling him if you work really hard this year i can buy another one of them next year I, i i just think it was reasonable um Actually, most of you agree, but at least two of you don't. 10.35 is the time. Wayne is in Kingsbridge. Wayne, what do you reckon? Seven-year-old Suzuki Swift. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a winner. We, ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. Go on. And it's, and it's actually a delivery vehicle. I don't but, even know um, what a Suzuki Swift is. Is it, is it one of those little putter-putter van sort of things? It, no, it's a little car. Oh, it's is it? Car. Okay. It's right. a little car. It's a lovely car. But, but, this yeah, is so why we I, don't I, do I, motoring phone-ins. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of who to trust, I think I can't speak for farmers, but no. I can speak for hospitality bosses i've been doing this for 15 years now okay. worked a lot longer in the industry than that but yes. um owning it 15 years and you were a very I'm helpful trying- guide for us to businesses getting through covid as well for people who, yeah. who don't listen as closely as frankly they should but wayne was a was a great um a, a, a vessel through which we could understand some of the issues facing businesses during lockdowns and, and beyond carry on thank you very kind of you to say um i i think you trust your own nerve trust that you know what you're doing and all will be well. I trust myself. Mm. I look after my staff, and I hope that in turn they look after me. I think I've mentioned it before. How I've paid for counselling sessions when staff have been having trouble. Instead of them having to take it out of their wages, I pay for it. Because that matters. A good, healthy workforce makes me good money. They're happier to customers. They turn up on time. They don't want to leave early. They've not got anything else in their mind. They're focused and they're performing and they're making me money. So if I've got to do a little bit to help them, great. So in terms of paying them more, paying staff more, I've got no problem with that whatsoever. And the rest will come. In terms of what's going to happen outside of my business, I can Mm. anecdotally say that we notice it when people buy a house particularly a young person, because in that time before they buy a house, all they're doing is saving, saving, saving. They're not getting luxuries. They're not doing all the fancy stuff. They are just saving a deposit and they're paying a rent for somebody else's mortgage to be paid. Yes. Then they get their own mortgage. Then they've got disposable income. Then they start spending money. So if the rest of the population have more money coming in, if their wages start to climb and businesses don't put their prices up and they take the hit to some of their profit, the rest will follow. So the bigger the business, the easier this analysis is to to sustain. And then it, it, then you get to to um, uh, people like our, our, our 
last caller in Huddersfield who might just be in that sweet spot or whatever the opposite of a sweet spot is, the sour spot where they are, and I believe him, I don't think he'd ring in and, and pull my leg or, 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 or swing the lead. They, they're one of a quarter, one of the four businesses he runs, one of the four sites he has, he thinks he's going to have to close. Yeah, and I feel that. And mm. it feels horrible. And you look at your wage bill and you're thinking, oh my God, it's climbing more and more and more. How on earth am I going to make this work? But it always does. And- so, yeah, I mean, this is the thing that amazes me about political rhetoric in this country is that if you're talking to someone who's using a food bank and you are from a certain political perspective, then you have no problem at all telling them that, you know, well, you're just going to have to get through it. You're just going to have to make changes. You're just going to have to crack on. You just Also, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you need to use a food bank. I think you spend all your money on flat screen televisions and, and, and Rothman cigarettes. And so that everyone's perfectly comfortable with that kind of rhetoric when they're talking to someone who's got diddly squat. But you're talking to someone who's got a big business, a big-ish business, um, and the idea that they are already operating on on tiny margins they've already cut everything back to the bone that they, they can't possibly afford to pay 20 year old men and women 20, 10 pounds an hour did you see it's, it's weird isn't it how that rhetoric i'm not suggesting either side is 100 percent right or 100 percent wrong but it'd be nice to come down somewhere in the middle but you you can also look at um supermarkets for example and the rise of the discount card you, 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 your club card your more card your whatever it is that as to use i don't go to that mm. <laughs> can tell you but um your nectars that all of a sudden they've got this price that you can go and buy it for and it's yes. like three quid cheaper yes well you're still making profit on that lower price why do i need a membership card to get that lower price you're clearly making enough money on that lower price to be able to sell it trying that. to stop you, you from going every, anywhere else of course yeah. but you can still so make i know money. you know i'm just i'm just trying to work because i've looked at my morrison's more card recently and if i've left my phone at home and I'm going to pay with, but I'll go back and get my phone because some of those discounts seem like ridiculous. The, the ones exactly. that the extra discount you get, and that is just to make sure you don't go anywhere else. No, but they're still making money. Yeah, of course they are, and it's still cheaper than it was six months ago. It's not like it's a price that's climbed higher and uh, just uh, the week before. These are I, I go every day. So thank you, Morrison's. You provide my veg. Um, <laughs> mm. um, but every day, and the price is. Have, have, have not gone up and then dropped. They've sustained at a high level and all of a sudden they can drop massively. And you can't tell me that they're going to be making a loss on half the stuff that they and, do and, that and, and the detail is lacking as well. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's not every business that's going to be affected. A small business, and I'm, I haven't at my, I got at my fingertips the definition of what a small business is, but the employment allowance is increasing for them from 5000 to ten and a half, and you can use that as a deduction against employers' national insurance liability. So, if you've got six employees earning thirty thousand pounds each, you're not going to see any increase at all in your employers' national insurance next year. No, and that's across your entire workforce as well. So it's not like it's just like limited to four people. No. So in terms of the what, increase, what's the cutoff national- point? Do you know what? 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 Definitely. Def- no. I, I just know it doesn't affect me. Yeah, um, fair enough. So, you know, I've not got a problem with increasing wages for my staff. I will do like I do every year. We've always paid above minimum wage. So our, our, our actual review for pay is in June rather than in April. Um, so, you know, they get a couple of months where it's a bit tighter. But then after that, it jumps up again. And it, it, that's how but it the margins works. will jump up as well. So if you've got 50 employees, you're looking at quite a big boost. You could have to find another £43,000 uh, in, in NI contributions next year. But you've got 50 employees. So... It's less than a £1,000 per employee. I'm not suggesting that's a pittance. I'm, I'm just suggesting that a well-run business can take it out of the profits. That's exactly it. Uh, yeah, and, and you are running a business, just in case anybody accuses you of being a, a, a naive, out-of-touch lefty. Oh, there's plenty of naive, out-of-touch lefties run businesses, but, but um, I just wanted to make that distinction clear. 10.41 is the time. So who are we going to trust? Two people there in the hospitality sector. One is pretty clear that he can't, unless he sells his car, he can't afford to keep his, his fourth site open. And one is close to what I feel intuitively. I did this after Brexit. Here's a thing you weren't expecting. See, one of the reasons why the idiocy of Brexit has been slightly mitigated so that people like our friend earlier can um, uh, 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 claim that things haven't gone badly. I I mean, to be fair, you've got to be getting up pretty early not to notice uh, almost all of the expert analysis. But let's pretend that that's possible and plausible. I said to you from day one, business business will be the biggest um, bullock, bulwark. How do you pronounce that word? 
I keep seeing it written down. I go, there was a podcast as well I was referencing last week. I kept I meant to memo to self, must learn how to pronounce that word correctly. But the biggest bulwark against some of the impacts of Brexit will be the nimble footedness and the creativity of businesses. I, I'm a great admirer of the entrepreneurial spirit. And obviously, there comes a point where you run the risk of crushing it. Some of the tax rates that were endemic in the 70s were, were, make your eyes water. But we're a million miles away from that now. And, and so you, you know that if you can say after Brexit, business will find a way around all this, then you can say business will find a way through this. Maybe some businesses won't. But who do you trust when you're trying to get a handle on how many and who? Claire's in York. Claire, what would you like to say? Hi, what Hello. a great caller your last caller was. It really gives you faith still in, 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 in humans. Because well, I if you're ever in Kingsbridge, get yourself, I, I think it's called Comet Pizza. Let me just check the name of the pizza restaurant and I'll, I'll, you can pop round and buy a margarita off him <laughs> next time you're in Devon. Pizza um, Planet. Well, pizza Planet in Kingsbridge. Well, there we go. I knew I'd, I'd, I'd go. go on. Sorry. Carry on, Claire. Well, I mean, everyone wants better public services and infrastructure, but no one seems to want to pay for it and would rather whine or leave the country, it seems, than actually be part of the solution. And and I don't think we have to take on trust what will happen no. if, w with what Labour are doing, because we have empirical evidence of what will happen if the NA, NI is, t is taken up, because in 2022, the... Tory government put up national insurance tax yes. and no one complained. No one was, no, there was no radio phone in saying, people saying, oh, we're going to leave the country. <laughs> Our businesses are going under. We're going to have to. Well, this um, was this was sold everyone. to us. This was sold to us as, as patching up some of the holes left by the COVID bailout, was it? By furlough yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's and, not going away. And to doing to, to to mend the NHS and right. social social care. And then when the NI was brought back down last year, the IFS said that was totally irresponsible. They did. And 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 also, what really upset me... What are you doing me, listening to these independent experts instead of getting all your news directly from the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail, Claire? Honestly, no I, wonder you've I got know. such radical opinions. <laughs> but what really upset me is when the £20 universal credit uplift was given, was taken away from really poor families, which really affected them on a weekly basis. Really, I mean, really affected them. Yeah. No one complained. There was no phone-ins about but how well, they were I, There was, actually, madam, with respect. I think you'll find, at least in this in this space. Well, I'm, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. <laughs> but, this is, but this is across the board. Everyone just can't... And there would know, have been like phone-ins. Sorry to interrupt you happen. again, but there would definitely have been phone-ins. And I would far be it from me to think or even speculate on the kind of names that might have been behind such policy decisions. But there would definitely definitely have been phonies about how people didn't need it anyway, Claire. Yeah, well, well maybe so. I'll, 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 um, We've I'll all heard those. To that. But, but uh, you know, I think we're caring about the wrong people disproportionately. You know, when, when, when there are young families who are really scraping, uh, uh, you know, just to get by each week, but by new shoes for their kids mm. and we're worrying about businesses having to pay a bit of more and national yeah, insurance but which they paid two they paid two years ago this is true well so yes i mean i guess you would say that if you're struggling to buy shoes for your children then you'll struggle even more if the company you work for goes bust as a consequence of policies that they genuinely can't afford so we can't completely ignore them can we well that certainly if you buy into the fact that businesses genuinely can't afford it and i don't gen i don't i don't buy that. I, it's just I, I, the, so where do we put the line some can most can not all can there'll be some that are close to the wire but we're not normally invited to feel sorry for people who are struggling by the people who are telling us to feel sorry for these people who are struggling by the people who are telling us to feel sorry for farmers with five million pound estates it's extraordinary isn't it I, it, it, it really is i mean i just think that we've got our, our um our priorities really out of whack here and basically someone has got to pay for for getting the country back on its feet and and people complained about you know the, the pensioners you know because it why was that there on their shoulders now we're complaining about people who have you know businesses who 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 aren't sort of on yes you know you know huddled by a by a one bar fire you know and, well i said you know, that was like going to happen can't win. no well i did say i don't not to toot my own horn but i did say i think part of the reasoning behind this going so early with the winter fuel allowance 
is because they c could then realistically turn around and say, well, we've asked pensioners to do their bit, so why the heck shouldn't we ask millionaires? We've asked pensioners to do their bit, so why the heck shouldn't we ask business people? But, you know me, Claire, it's, it's, uh, it never ceases to amaze me how little traction logic has when it comes to the effort put into defending the interests of the already epically wealthy. Thank you. A quick, quick shout. Claire was actually in York. But a quick shout out to Claire in Yule, who just had a panic attack because she thought that she'd rung in by accident. I said, Claire's in York. Oh, my God, I've just rung James. I didn't mean to do that. And also to Helen, who says, that's a really excellent reference to the universal credit, James. Labour's played a blinder by lowering the national insurance threshold. They've removed the incentive for large employers to put staff who would quite like a full-time contract on a part-time contract. But again, you won't be reading that on your Daily Mail front page or, or um, hearing it anytime soon from a conservative politician, despite the fact that come election time, they'll still be after your votes. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10.51. Uh, obviously, in eight minutes or so, we will lead into, introduce the observation, observance of the two minutes silence to mark the moment that fighting ended in the First World War in 1918. So uh, just be aware that that is on the horizon. Um, on an altogether lighter note, I have, I think, one of my all-time favourite missing word uh, rounds. Uh, this is a, I don't think anyone's going to get this. This is an absolute humdinger. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Cambridge Council cuts. All right, I'm going to give you a little clue, which I shouldn't do, but it is. it appeals not only to my love of riddles, but also to my love of alliteration, this headline. Okay, shall we, shall we? Cambridge Council cuts may force blank from city centre. Cambridge Council cuts, not cauliflower, although that would fit with the alliteration point, wouldn't it? Cambridge Council cuts may force blank from city centre. Uh, remember, you can text uh, or WhatsApp me on 03456060973 or text 84850. I should also tell you, before we go to John in Aberdeen, which we will do imminently, John, panic not, I am migrating more now social media wise towards the blue sky app which is no longer invitation only and which this weekend seemed to reach a sort of momentum that suggests it may become a viable alternative to uh, the, the platform elon musk bought and incredibly quickly to give him credit turned into an absolute sewer so i, I just may find myself uh, reflecting that on the show as well the fact that i'm now more likely to see your messages on Blue Sky than I am to see your messages on what was once uh, affectionately known as Twitter. But there's there's your missing word round, at least. 10.52 is the time. They are bringing in changes to national insurance. They are a little bit more nuanced than much of the coverage would allow. And the reason for that is that the coverage is shrill to the point of hysterical. Won't somebody think of the business owners, is the um, un- written bit of all the headlines warning that everything is going to go under i reminded you at 10 o'clock this morning they told us exactly the same thing about minimum wage claire in york just reminded you that we had a similar um uh, hike if you like that sort of language introduced by the last government without the hysterical response so who do you trust how can we know whether to be worried about this or cautiously encouraged that the Labour government's mission to prioritise the NHS over everything else and possibly prioritise workers over employers while still respecting the latter to the nth degree might actually be working. John's in Aberdeen. John, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Uh, like long time listener and first time caller and a bit nervous as well. Oh, well, that's only me. Welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yes, well, I kind of want to give, uh, there's probably a lot of SMEs um, who are fans of yourself shouting at the radio just now. Um, I'm not particularly too worried about the Tesco's and the Asda's mm. of the world. They will survive. Um, but the SMEs out there um, on hearing the national insurance increase will be, um, they'll be very nervous. Over the last, I'm going to say the last 14 years, the the erosion of margins in businesses has, has been incredible. Um, and this increase continues that erosion. Um, and I heard your caller say, you know, there was, there's been past increases uh, passed on by government and businesses survive. And I'm not saying that everything's going to go bust tomorrow. Sure. But I think the caller, the guy there, I, I can't remember what business he said he had. He had four units 
yeah. uh, for businesses. And one but it was, was in hospitality. Them. I think he had th- yeah. th- three pubs and a gastro pub, reading between the lines, because it was yeah. the one that did a lot of food that he felt and, and had quite a young workforce. So that yeah. was more on the um, minimum wage, I think, than on the national insurance yeah. angle. But still, uh, he felt he may not survive. He wouldn't survive. Yeah. And the, the, the erosion over the last kind of 14, 15 years, and it's not been... It's been quite a a hard, fast erosion. Normally, businesses can can they will slightly change, they'll adapt, and they'll they'll change. And over the years, that's generally what would happen. But over the last kind of ten, fifteen years, then the margins have eroded for SMEs very drastically, um, and they continue to do so. And I'm not saying that um, you know somebody has to pay. Well, what are you the, basing this on? Just from experience. <laughs> yeah, so but you can say my margins have gone down. You can't say all SMEs have. And for, for just for clarity, it's a, a, we're talking about businesses with fewer than 50 employees who will be hugely insulated from the national... Well, completely insulated from much of the impact of the national yeah. insurance changes. So um, I don't know how many staff our friend in Huddersfield had, but I, I presume if he closes one of his venues, he'll probably dip under the 50 yeah. employee mark. So that might be pertinent to his decision-making yeah. as well. But most people listening do not feel that business owners got a got a, a rough end of the deal from 14 years of Tory government. Yeah. I mean, for me, then, it's big business that should be getting targeted more and more. But what is your um, definition I mean, I, of big? Because obviously it's not 50 well, employees and over. You'd go up to, what, 500 or 1,000? I mean, how many? Well, I would have to look at the figures and balance it out. But you're looking, you know... You're, you well, that's what they've done. And it. they've come up with 50 as being a helpful cutoff point. Because otherwise... I don't, I don't think 50 is I don't think 50 is that much, to be honest with you. No, um, I, I don't do. think 50 is that much. I do. In, t- in terms of, if, if I don't know, per capita profit, the amount of profit that you're making per employee, who's most likely to be able to afford it? 50 seems like a fairly reasonable point to suggest that you might be able to afford six or 700 quid per employee per year. But on top of all the previous year's erosion, and I'm not seeing well, that. But again, that's why wage. I picked you up on that, because that, you just said that's entirely anecdotal. Well, the thing is, over the last few years, the erosion has happened. Now, if you look at that, you know, it, you know, your insurance costs have gone up, you've got pension contributions, gas and electricity is absolutely sky high for businesses at the moment. You've got IT costs that have gone up, and then you've got additional but costs. But that's inflation. That never, everything's gone up. Yeah, everything's gone up. Including and wages. Because of the, the, the profit margin... Well, not wages. I mean, no, wages so, so, in some ways, you're arguing the opposite of what you think you're arguing. Because where are they going to get the money from? If everything's gone up and they're paying for it as a government, they're paying for the NHS, they're paying doctors' wages, nurses' wages, you, you've got to pay energy. Guess what, John? So do hospitals. Where are they, they going to get be, the money from? They need to be targeting bigger businesses. And I'm not but talking that's always the way, isn't it? It's, 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 it's tax rises for thee, but not for me. No, it's, yes, it's not. that's what you're saying. It's not. No. It is. It's not, not my business, his business. Not my business, that bigger one over there. How many did you employ in your last business? In my, in my last business, yeah. nearly 300. Nearly 300. So I'll tell you exactly who they should be hitting hard. People with 304 employees. That's who they should be hitting. No, going. not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but you've got to understand how the minimum wage has changed over the years. Yes. And the fact that if you're on the minimum wage now and you're working, say, 45 hours a week, your your salary is, what, £28,500 or there, there or thereabouts, roughly off the top of my head. Yes. Now, if you look at then the starting wage of a nurse, with the minimum wage going up just now, it pushes everything up. And years ago, when the minimum okay. national minimum wage came in, which was great, I never paid my, I always paid my, my younger staff more uh, because... I, you know, I I really, really wanted them to stay with me for years and years and years. And I didn't, and, and I didn't understand. I didn't I, I, John, you know, there, I, I can mess up the time on most days, but I can't mess it up on today of all days because this is LBC. And uh, um, we will very shortly be marking the um, commemoration, the observation of the two-minute silence. So, so I just wanted to interrupt you a little bit earlier than I usually do so that it sounds marginally less clumsy than it would have done if I'd waited until until the actual moment. Um, so we'll observe the silence, then we'll have the headlines, and then we'll be back.
This is LBC. It's coming up to 11 o'clock on Armistice Day. In a moment, we will join the nation in pausing for two minutes to mark the moment that fighting ended in the First World War in 1918. And we will remember all those who have died for their country in battle since. At the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, we will remember them. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I may allow myself a little early mystery hour on that. Why, why is Keir Starmer the first Prime Minister to have attended Armistice Day celebrations, celebrations, commemorations in France since Winston Churchill? Is there a reason for that? Is there, is there something that you know that I don't know that explains it? Or is it just the way that the the cookie has crumbled over the years, over the decades. I, ge I genuinely don't know, but I think it's right to, 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 it's newsworthy, certainly. But it's curious to me. I'm going to play a little game with you next. Um, and then we're going to talk about the people who seem to think that the poppy is a weapon with which to hit other people, as opposed to something that is a symbol, whether you choose to wear it or not, of unity and, um, and commemoration. I'm going to tell you about the 1847 10 Hours Act. I got a text that said, do you remember the 10 Hours Act of 1847? To which my response was, I'm old, mate, but flipping heck, I'm not that old. So I, I needed to look it up. I thought I knew what it was. I think it features in the rather splendid Museum of Working People in Manchester, which I may have got the title slightly wrong of, but it's a magnificent place if you get the chance to visit. Uh, if, if I'd started telling, this is amazing, actually, for 21st century sensibilities. If I started telling you that the 1847 Ten Hours Act was introduced after a couple of aristocrats wanted to make it possible for women and children working in textile mills to work for 10 hours on a weekday and eight hours on a Saturday, I could sell that to you, right? I could say, God, this, this, that Earl of Shaftesbury, he was a right old git, wasn't he? Hey, that's what he did. He was responsible for bringing in the 10 hours out. And do you know what it meant? It meant that women could work 10 hours now, Monday to Friday, and eight hours on a Saturday. 1847, a long time ago, but on a day of commemoration and remembrance, perhaps not as far away as it would feel on another day. Because it wasn't that at all. The 10 Hours Act in 1847, which many, many mill owners and no doubt the early equivalents of the Daily Mail and had there been any radio phone-ins in 1847, I'm sure there'd have been plenty of people queuing up to claim that these businesses can't possibly afford it. These textile mills can't possibly afford it because the 1847 10 Hours Act reduced the number of hours that women and children could work in factories to 10 hours Monday to Friday and eight hours on a Saturday. I'll say that again. 1847. Your, what, great, great, great grandparents? Maybe a little more than that. If they were in the relevant part of the country and of a suitable economic background, they would have been doing 12 hours Monday to Friday. Children and women. Didn't apply to men, this. Children and women doing 12. And, and until the rather splendid Anthony Ashley Cooper, later the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, came along, and, uh, and a parliamentarian called John Fielden, it was furiously resisted. And they brought in legislation that reduced the number of hours that women and children could work in mills from uh, 12 to 10 hours and 8 hours on a Saturday. Kicked in in 1847, kicked in fully May the 1st, 1848. And no doubt they'd have been queuing up to say they couldn't afford it and also saying, how are these people going to pay for their gruel if they can only work 10 hours a day. I don't know whether some people would have claimed they have, we're going to have to close their mills. We're going to have to close our mills. And then some idiot on the radio would have asked them how many horses they had for their horse-drawn carriage. It's 8-11, 8 after 11. Plus ça change, eh? Plus ça change. Quite a few of you following my lead over to Blue Sky on the social media front. I don't think you'll regret it. it, it it's, it's quite nice, actually, to spend some time on social media and not come away feeling as if you've been dipped in manure. But it's on to an entirely different 
topic that I would like to move next. And I... I I I, listen, I'm going to say something that I really do passionately believe. I really like wearing a poppy. I, 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 I get a little swell of something emotional when I see them for sale, usually at a London underground station. And I, 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 I did see a letter in the newspapers this weekend that pointed out we used to confine the wearing to the 11th day, to, to the 11th of November. And, uh, and beyond that day, it was not considered necessary. Something has happened in the course of my lifetime whereby you now feel uh, compelled, either in a good way or a bad way, which is a little taste of the conversation that we're about to have, to wear a poppy for, for the best part of a fortnight, it sometimes seems. But I like wearing a poppy. Uh, I am not stupid. I do understand the hideousness of war. The First World War in particular is impossible to portray as a battle between good and evil in a way that I think the Second World War is possible to portray. First World War, essentially a battle between two cousins, two, two grandsons, I think, of Queen Victoria who um, had ended up heading up different royal families. So, uh, you know, the idea that your great-grandfather made a noble sacrifice in the First World War is both defensible and challengeable. I defend it, I, I, and I'm more from a position of emotion than intellect, because if ever footballification reaches its apotheosis, it's when it comes to war. My country right or wrong. And I think for my generation, and possibly older ones, the insidiousness of the Nazis has given us a slightly skewed view of war. It's made us think that all wars... I wonder if without the Nazis, you'd have people claiming that the empire was an unalloyed force for good or that it did more benefit to the colonies that we essentially conquered in a commercial sense rather than a military sense. I wonder whether the Nazi shadow makes us see almost everything through the lens of British good, rest of the world bad. I'm I just wondering out loud because, as I say, I, I derive proper pleasure, proper personal pleasure. From wearing, a, uh, from wearing a poppy. But I want to tell you something else as well that's really important. I would never dream of criticising your right not to wear one. It seems to me to be an act of such egregious hypocrisy and insensitivity that you wonder whether anybody who casts themselves in the role of having the right to tell other people what they can and can't or should or shouldn't do with regard to poppies is aware of what the poppy is supposed to commemorate. What did your great-granddad die for? So that I could come on the radio in the morning and hit people over the head with their poppy-based decisions. It's highly unlikely, don't you think? It's, it's extraordinary. I've seen a couple of things. Ke Kevin Maguire, um, a pal of mine, although I haven't seen him for years, works at the Mirror, always very strong on this. It's, it's one of the most fundamental rights. If you think of freedom of speech being somewhat contrarily, one of the most fundamental tenets of freedom of speech is the freedom not to say anything. I don't know whether philosophically you can translate that into the rights you get read by a police officer where you have the right not to say anything. You can't be tortured or forced to speak. Anything you do say may be taken down and used in evidence against you, but you have the right to remain silent. It's a fundamental tenet of free speech, the opposite of oppression and, and, and torture. You have the right not to wear a poppy. Of course you have the right not to wear a poppy. I can't quite believe that anybody feels a genuine sense of offence at other. I just think it's an invitation to be, it's an invitation to side with the bullies that many people find impossible to resist. There's a footballer, I don't know if you're aware of him, who in many ways is, is better known. Um, well, it depends, I suppose, what sort of public discourse you're engaged in. But James McLean is um, an Irish footballer who very much um, annually has to give interviews to the Belfast Telegraph or, or, or gets reported in the newspapers as refusing to bend the knee, refusing to stand with his teammates on Remembrance Sunday. I think he's playing for Wrexham now and he would almost, I haven't checked, but he would almost certainly, if he was on the pitch this weekend, have, have declined to take part in Remembrance commemorations this weekend. And as a consequence of, among other things, what the, what the British military did in Ireland, did to his forebears, did to his, 
ancestors. Um, and I respect his right to do that. I completely respect his right to do that. He, he grew up on the Cregan estate in Derry, where six of the people um, murdered by the British Army on Bloody Sunday were from um, 28 unarmed civilians shot during a peaceful protest um, in the, the month that I was born, in January of 1972. He chooses also not to wear a poppy, but as he says himself, I choose not to wear one, but no one ever asks me why. They say I'm being disrespectful. If they did ask me, I'd tell them that if it was just about World War I and World War II victims, I'd wear it without a problem. I would wear it every day of the year if that was the thing, but it doesn't. It stands for all the conflicts that Britain has been involved in. Because of the history of where I come from in Derry, I cannot wear something that represents that. You don't have to agree with him. But what are you if you attack him? What are you if you're telling somebody else what they should and shouldn't wear? I saw one professional blowhard, formerly of this parish, complaining about not enough people on the BBC wearing poppies, and he claimed that it offended our forebears. And I think his seriousness in the context of public discourse is best expressed by the fact that he literally wrote four bears, as in, like, the sequel to Goldilocks. Goldilocks and the forebears. It's offending. I can't believe how few people are wearing poppies on the BBC. It's an insult to our forebears. Which forebears? Mummy bear, daddy bear, baby bear. Who's the fourth bear? What? Paddington bear? I don't know who they I have no idea. Cousin bear? Just another bear? So, you know, people of a certain um, ilk, you can always feel the relish on Remembrance Day or on... Um, uh, if, 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 the, if the dates align, you can almost feel the relish with which certain commentators and certain online warriors start sharpening up their poppies to use as weapons with which they can attack other people. I find it genuinely extraordinary. I really do. Two stories in the news today. The first is about why young people are, and I'm reading the headline, scared to wear the poppy. Um, I, I, I believe the people that the Daily Telegraph has spoken to, but I don't know that I recognise the description that they deploy, except in the sense that it has been hijacked by the people I'm describing. It's been hijacked in the way that the Union flag was hijacked by the far right. This perhaps is what, what young people scared to wear the poppy think. The, the idea that it is almost I'm being ordered to wear it by people who quite possibly... Um, have very little understanding of what it is we are supposed to be commemorating. And then there's another one, um, which again I think comes around every year, and some people use it as an opportunity to attack free speech, to attack freedom of choice, to attack freedom of expression, and it's the Peace Pledge Union, uh, the pacifists in another word, in another way of saying it, that, that um, choose to wear a white poppy on, um, on, on Remembrance Day choose to uh, commemorate Remembrance Sunday events um, by calling for an examination of the human cost of colonial conflicts, which again, uh, you, you may not necessarily think is necessary. Uh, you may not like history. Or you may think, well, can't we take a day off from actual history? And not? You might like the National Trust people. You might not want to know about the history of the house that you're visiting when you visit a house with a history. You may just want to, uh, I don't know, eat the scones, although they're vegan. Uh, or you, you might recognise that you can't really commemorate the fallen without examining where they fell and asking broader questions about why they fell or who else fell too. And so the poppy seems to me to be a almost unique emblem of freedom. So why do some people use it? As the opposite. Why do some people use it as, a, as an attack upon other people's freedom? Why does, well, what is it that's going on here? 0345 60973 is, uh, is the number that you need. Someone called Colonel Richard Kemp is quoted in the Telegraph. I didn't realise this, I have to be honest, when I just said that, that people might hold this view. But he thinks it's all by all means do it, but do it on a different day. So freedom is all very well, but not on the days that I don't think you should have it on. Don't do it on the day that we commemorate people who died to give us the freedoms that we have today. Can you imagine the mental gymnastics involved in thinking that you're commemorating freedoms while telling other people 
what they can and can't do according to whatever date has popped up on the calendar. So I say it again, I really like wearing a poppy. Uh, it, 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 it makes me think about people. In previous years, and we haven't done it this year, but we may do it next year, I may return to it. My friend Toby Tarrant posted a picture that got me right in the heart strings of his granddad. Um, in fact, his dad, who you would know as Chris Tarrant, <laughs> I just say that because Toby knows him as dad. But Toby posted a lovely picture of his granddad, his dad, and him, a very young him, and, 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 and then a picture of him in his uniform. And that those are the things. And I'm sorry, but if there is a, a fascist wave, if it rises again, then you will be grateful for the feelings that are engendered by photographs like that. If there's another round of Nazism and we are uh, opposed to it, then you need to be able to appeal to that sort of emotion in order to get people to lay down their lives for everybody else. And the poppy brings that home to me. So why do some people insist? What, what is it that they're doing? I, d I genuinely don't know. You know that I feel that an awful lot of people who condemn others' lack of patriotism are quite dangerous in the sense that real patriotism is is about a move towards unity, a move towards fellow feeling, commonality. We have more in common than sets us apart, and yet some people insist on using it as a club with which to beat others over the head. Some people use it as a cloak for racism, although by no means all. But the poppy in my lifetime has gone from being something that I'm fairly confident was supremely uncontroversial. Nobody ever felt they had the right to tell other people what they could and couldn't do with their poppy if you're telling me not to wear a poppy I've, I've got a problem with you as well by the way if you're telling me i shouldn't wear a poppy because of bad stuff that has been done by british soldiers over the years james mclean's not telling you that you can't wear a poppy he's simply telling you if you care to ask him why he doesn't want to Incredible that this Kemp fellow could write about what we do to commemorate people who died to give us the freedoms that we have today, it, while suggesting in the same breath that the best way to commemorate people who died to give us the freedoms that we have today is to limit the freedoms that we have today. The freedom not to wear a poppy without being insulted or attacked. The freedom to wear a white poppy without being insulted or attacked. We're going to commemorate the freedoms that people died to give to us today. How? By shouting at people exercising their freedom. You see why I'm confused. I, I would have thought that even four seconds of thinking about this would have delivered the conclusion that this is quite a strange road to go down. But here we are. Why are young people are scared to wear the poppy? Remembrance Day should be decolonised, say campaigners, who have harmed precisely nobody with their calls for a little bit more understanding of some historical repercussions and nuances but how are we going to commemorate the people who died for our freedom by condemning people for exercising that freedom what's going on oh three four five six oh six oh nine so how did this happen when i was a kid i'm sure it was uncontroversial what's happened oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three and I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk to you if you have a relationship with the poppy that is not binary, okay? That, that is, you don't actually want to wear one, but for reasons. And, as a, and I'd like to talk to military veterans, and I'd like to know what you think about this. Some people call it poppy fascism. This idea that you can't, if you, t if you appear on television without your poppy on, you can guarantee a social media pylon and all sorts of attacks from all sorts of idiots who would probably claim that you're insulting the people who died for our freedoms by exercising your freedoms. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060973 is the number you need. Tell me about your relationship and why you feel it's almost you're not permitted to have a complicated or a nuanced relationship with the poppy. Tell me about how, as a military veteran or indeed as a serving member of our forces, you feel about what has become known as poppy fascism. And, uh, and tell me why they do it. Get inside the head of the weirdos. Why do they do it? Why do they try to turn the poppy a symbol of peace in many ways why do they try and turn a symbol of peace into a weapon i know the obvious answer is because they are weapons james but let's try and be a bit more grown up than that james o'brien on lbc it is 25 minutes after 11 when did it become a weapon with which to hurt other people the poppy and why 
Uh, maybe you think it should be. Maybe you quite like attacking people, exercising their freedom as a way of commemorating people who died for our freedom. But I, you're going to have to explain it to me. Rob's in Birmingham. Rob, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. You're right. um, I'm a, a veteran, um, 27 years in the British Army. Um, I'm also Irish um, and had a, I've been all over the world with the Army, the best times of my life. Mm. Um, my view on the whole thing is that I would just imagine that most soldiers um, would have the same view as me, is that um, we, we did the things that we did so people could have the right to choose what they wanted to do. So if someone doesn't want to wear the poppy, or if someone wants to wear a white poppy, that's fine by me. Just let me do the thing that I want to do and remember the friends that I lost my way. Yes, your way. Yeah. And that's, to me, yeah. the, that's the, you've just described, you've just distilled the essence of freedom. I, I will do it my way. Because if we were, God forbid, we lost some of the conflicts that are commemorated on a day like today, then individual freedom would have been one of the first things to disappear. Yeah, I think as well that um, like you see a lot of it on the TV and I watched with well, my wife, I must say, mm. Strictly Come Dancing the other night. And, <laughs> um, and the guys on there doing their training they were all wearing poppies, and I was thinking that's they're just not going to be wearing that if they if they're in their scrubs and they're just messing around and and training. That's because the TV says they've got to put on there because they're afraid of what people will will say. And you know, James McLean, you know, fair play to him. If that's what he wants to do, then that's fine. I can understand his point of view. Certainly, being Irish as well, and not you know, telling again, anybody, not telling you or me or anyone else not to wear one. Simply saying, I won't wear one myself, and I would if it was just commemorating World War One and Two. But it's not. It's it's commemorating everything that's ever been done in the sense uh, by, by by the British Army. Some of which makes him profoundly uncomfortable, as it does me. Yeah. Although I don't yeah. feel it in the way that he feels it, and I'm free to do what I do. I'm free to do. Where do you think it comes from? The people that want to use it as a weapon. I, I just want to thank you, Rob, if I may, for putting perfectly that because I know you weren't in any way criticising anybody involved in Strictly Come Dancing, but but it is not a normal thing to do. If the cameras weren't there, they wouldn't have had their poppies on. Not for a not for a dancing rehearsal. You might as well have had them on on the you know on the in a swimming pool or something like that. But they know that if they didn't do it, there would be some people desperate to turn it into a brouhaha. So you've put that quite perfectly. But you're, I think you're a similar age to me, a bit younger, judging by your uh, the length of your military record. But when did it become a weapon? When did people start trying to turn the poppy into a weapon? I think we live in a world now where. People are on one side of the fence or on the other side of the fence. And it's a reaction to maybe some people being vocal about not wearing it. And yeah. then it makes the people who want to wear it more vocal. And it's just an echo chamber and it goes around and around when the vast majority of people aren't really that affected by it. It's just the ones that you hear. Yeah, and I guess we're all a little bit guilty sometimes of, of, of letting the... The noise run away with the news, as you as you might say, and and I don't know. Some days I don't know whether doing conversations like this is an antidote to it or part of the problem. But thanks to callers like you, I'm confident that today at least it's very much antidote. You know, how dare anybody decide what other people can do in the context of a poppy that is supposed to be a symbol of freedom and, and commemoration? Rob, thank you, and thank you for your service as well. And I know Americans normally say that. I think it's one of the few things we could learn from America and do a little bit more. Here as well. It's coming up to half past 11. Where, where do we think it comes from? He's onto something there. Do we know when it started? Why it started? But who decided it would be a good idea to start metaphorically sharpening up the previously entirely placid poppy and using it as a weapon with which to hurt people who you couldn't even be bothered to try to understand in the first place? Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.32 is the time. Uh, do you know what is really helpful? It, it, stopping to think about why you do things and I wonder whether the relationship between how much time you spent thinking about why you do something and how quick you are to attack other people for doing something different from what you do is quite close so I, I got a message saying I'm so glad you're proud to wear the poppy I am too it's a lovely message I, I, but I wondered whether is proud the word I'd use I think it's more grateful than proud I, I've got nothing to be proud of really grateful 
in the in the context of most military conflicts, many of which would not have affected me in in in, in any particular way, especially the the colonial campaigns or, or the ones that throw right back to British Empire. But the 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 reason why I wear it. God, isn't that a bit scary? How, how many times, how many years now have you been wearing a poppy or not wearing a poppy? How many times have you asked yourself why you wear it? Well, because I, I just, well, you know, the soldier. The, but, yeah, but why do you wear it? Why do you wear it? You wear it to say thank you to people who are no longer here. And you wear it to say thank you to those people like Rob, our last caller, who will be there should that potential sacrifice ever be needed again it's the one area where i make no apology to you for being dewy-eyed or sentimental i i, I know the army is like any other organization under the sun and, it, and that means it contains the full gamut of human conditions the full range of humans but i do i'm afraid um, feel something very very different when i contemplate the military whether they're marching up the mall on a day like today or, or, or whether we're reading history books or something i don't know why and I think it hinges on the knowledge deep, deep down that without people who are prepared to die for us, then almost all of the things that we value would be jeopardized. So why do you wear a poppy? And why do people get so cross with those who have thought about it and decided, do you know what, it's not for me? It's not for me. The weirdest thing probably is to knit together several of the narratives we've explored so far and reflect upon the fact that if somebody chose, as used to be the norm, only to wear it on the 11th of November, only to wear it on Remembrance Day and possibly the adjacent Sunday as well, they would get attacked, as Rob reminded us, by some sort of media uh, characters and, and, and others. They would get attacked. Why aren't you wearing a poppy? It's November the 8th. Why aren't you wearing a poppy? It's November the 7th. It's, it's bizarre. Where, where, where does it come from? What is it that is happening that I can't quite get my head around? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Because whatever you do, whatever you do, you might wear a purple poppy to commemorate animals that served in war and dived in con died in conflict. You might wear a white poppy um, uh, to draw attention to some of the uh, antics or exploits of the British Empire that probably shouldn't be glorified or, or certainly whitewashed. I've seen pride poppies. I saw a pride poppy yesterday. I hadn't seen one of those before. It was a, a poppy with a, a flag attached, I think a, a, a ex-military. Well, none of that affects me. I saw, saw someone who's not wearing a poppy. None of that in any way impacts on my ability to say thank you. So why do people get cross about it? I know some people do it for money, all right? I appreciate being a controversialist. Uh, that, that's a living. I guess I'm possibly guilty of that sometimes, although I hope not. But, but why? Nothing you do affects my ability and my freedom to say, do you know what, thank you. Thank you so much. Instead of going, why aren't you wearing one? Or why are you wearing a yellow one? Or why are you wearing... Just don't get it. Mike's in Wrexham. Mike, what do you reckon? Good morning, sir. Hello, Mike. Um, 16 years service. Um, third generation um, Gosh. British military. Right, you're qualified. Um, Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Just something, anyway. Um, oh, my, um, my relationship as it is with the puppy, has always been ambivalent. Yes. My grandfather, who was um, injured on the Somme, God. refused to wear the puppy. Did he really? Yes. Um, he saw it as, as Kitchener's sop for public attention um, to um, mitigate his... His sins, as my grandfather perceived. Yeah. Um, well, this is yeah, the this is, is the rhetoric of lions led by donkeys. That's the, the very same. Um, wow. um Still very proud of, of his story. Oh, of, of, of course. No, I say proud of his service. Proud of his comrades. Yeah. Um, it's a crucial I, distinction, and, and in some ways, the oh. poppy blurs that line, doesn't it? It takes away. Autonomy, almost intellectual and emotional autonomy. You could, because a lot of people who thought fought in the First World War, uh, latterly arrived at the conclusion your granddad arrived at. But, but if that if that conclusion had been allowed to become mainstream, 
it's arguable that we'd have been able to fight the Second World War in the way that we did. Do you see what I mean? It does make people start to question policy. Yeah. Um, and, and we can't have that, can we? I mean, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm in the no context, this is why I find the Second World War so fascinating, because I think in the context of the Second World War, there is no room for, for, for policy discussions or debates or nuance. But in almost every other war ever... Uh, trying to typify it as a battle between good versus evil when people who shared the same accident as birth as you were the good ones is ridiculous. Never more so than in the First World War. But then we did get to write the history I know. Um, yeah. the, 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 of the Second World War. Um, let's be honest, um, no apology. The British, the British military have participated in some really quite outrageous uh, actions. Yes. Um, Bloody Sunday being one. Um, but let's not go down that path. No. Um, we're, not, we're, we're not saints. We have, we've never been saints. Now, I attended a remembrance service uh, or at, at, at the village Senator yesterday, and I wore my poppy. Yes. I mirror the previous caller's comments that I did it in my own way. When the sky pilots start talking about God, and... <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and I hear people... Hopping on, no, no, so that's that's so so doggery. Um, sort of m- mimicking these these the, the, the holy. What did Bob Dylan do this song? If God's on your side, yeah. Um, yes, it is. You're right. It's a mythology. It's a mythology of yes, the human condition. Because because there's nothing admirable about conflict. Um, no, I, I was there, but I, I, I wasn't. They, they felt the need to bring religion into it and God and justification, etc. Each to their own. I'm mirroring a previous caller's sentiment. <laughs> the irony is live and let live. That's why we did it. That's a beautiful phrase. Where, where did it begin then? As you look back over, I mean, because your family's obviously had quite a nuanced relationship with it all for three generations now, but when did it become a, a weapon that the usual renter god <sighs> would sharpen up every November and use to it, hit it, and hurt if other you people? Back, with? If you go back to Rudyard Kipling, um, he wrote a poem called Tommy. Yes. Do you, uh, you may be familiar, but the gist of it is that that with, with no, but when you were a kid, the poppy didn't. I know the poem, but it didn't. I don't think it started because the, when I was a kid, the poppy was a was a supremely uncontroversial symbol. I think. Uh, yeah, but the poppy has. It, but the, the, my point is that the military, anything to do with glory, perceived glory. Um, why were you bringing? The, uh, why were you bringing the poem into it? I jumped on you a bit too quickly. Then. Why, why? All right. All right. The, the reason being that um, it's it's the oh. It, it, it reflected glory, the, 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 the great uh, and the good. The, the Brit- yeah. Brit- 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 Britain never, never, never will be slaves, etc. That whole sort and, of thing. The part of the mythologizing. The, 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 absolutely, the marching and the uniforms and the, the guns and everything. And, and those, those, those are smart boys. And it's all well and good when everybody's marching up and down. Yeah. And, and being proud and, and, and that's the symbol of, of great, of what, what makes us great. Although your um, granddad would have liked that poem, I think, by Kipling, because it highlighted a lot of the hypocrisy with which we treat the military. It's a hypocrisy. It's, yes. it's, 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 and, and, and the poppy, is, uh, for, for me, is simply, it, it has become part of that symbolism. Um, it's something that um, those who wish to make political capital can, can sit around and, and do the finger pointing. Yeah. No, no puppies. That that means, and I admire that young chap who's the footballer, James McLean. So do the Royal British Legion. Would you believe they've often um, come to defend his freedom in in choosing to do what he wants uh, to do? Absolutely, but that's that's the blinking point. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. That's it. That's the full stop on this call, Mike. I look forward to talking to you again. But you you share my frustration. I sense that sometimes. Ofcom putting limits on what words we can use, but that is indeed the blinking point. Um, what, 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 yeah, so I mean, it's an odd one, isn't it? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need if you uh, if you uh, can give us a little bit of help in understanding the psychology of wanting to turn it into a weapon. The people who feel that they can sit in in a judgment on what poppies you can wear, when you should wear them, what you can commemorate, what you can't commemorate, what you. Um, uh, what you do, what you don't do, what days you have to wear it. Um, uh, Saqib is in Bedford. Saqib, what would you like to say? Yeah, I wanted to uh, reflect on the conversations you had this morning, both on the white poppy and the wearing or not of the poppy in general. Uh, and particularly with my uh, background, uh, I was, uh, I mean, my parents were from India and I'm Muslim. And 
there were millions that fought both in the First and Second World War, both of Indian heritage, what is now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and also uh, uh, in the Second World War. And, you know, millions fought, you know, thousands, if not millions, died. And I think as a multicultural country now, I think there is a lot still wrapped up in whether it's a, perhaps to some degree a, a Christian remembrance of uh, obviously because of the ethnic makeup and religious makeup of the country at the time of the first and second world war in the uk yeah. as somebody commented you know history is written by by the uh, uh you know the ones that win or you know in whichever country you're in the, the, the victors always yeah angle. victors always yeah. write the history i mean that's a a, a, a given and yeah i think <laughs> It's an odd one, isn't it? Because it's a world war and it was fought on loads of fronts. And there were certainly, Mm -hmm. you know, as you say, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people fighting under the British flag who were never going to come to Britain, um, either before or after the war. And and I don't know. What what is it? Do you you spend, do you get back to the subcontinent? Well, get back. Do you go to the subcontinent? (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like Trump sending back 50 million people. Yeah, I know it does. But (laughs) but how is it commemorated there is what I was wondering. How how, how is it? Well, I mean, uh, one of my great uncles uh, was actually in the British Indian Army. And I saw a post of a family friend yesterday and he was saying two of his uncles actually died uh fighting uh yeah. for the uh for the british or obviously what was the british empire at that time because i think at that time you know pre-1947-48 then you were regarded as british or yeah. the british empire People well british i think you might have regarded yourself born. as british i don't know that you would have been regarded as certainly not once the east india company was in the box seat there was an incredible there was an apartheid basically in india before partition yeah. and what was it was it a hundred thousand people managed millions of people that was my favorite statistic i stumbled across it last a couple of months ago in a book i was reading and it was quite extraordinary and you can only do that by essentially inculcating the population with a notion of the superiority the racial supremacy of the mm-hmm of the ruling class but none of that is to uh, is relevant to commit well i don't know you see the 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 people promoting the peace pledge union the people promoting the white poppy would say it's essential on today of all days that we remember the role that um uh, the the things that issues like that played in the subjugation of the population of india colonial india yeah and i was thinking that actually when nick was challenging the guy about it uh, uh because I didn't I hear think, that. Yeah, I think it's right that, you know, as you're saying, in terms of freedom to have a white poppy, if people want to have a white poppy, mm. it's right that it's commemorated. Whether it's on today, that is perhaps uh, another debate. But I think, you know, all too often we remember the soldiers well, it's freedom. that it's freedom. Served it's any day and, you want. You know, have died. Yes. But you have, we, we, what day is there to remember the civilians that, you know, we obviously say that they are, you know, they're the uh, collateral damage, you know, they're not collateral damage, they're people, they're people's relatives, they're, you know, children. I, I, yeah, I guess that, that, you know, the civilian didn't sign up to die, knowing that they mm-hmm. might die, although the, the risk of it happening is, uh, you know, depending on the conflict, at least as high as it is for, for an actual uh, a military person. You'll like this from Roddy. He said, my brother is called Victor James and he hates history. <laughs> so it might need slightly revising that line thank you mate um i I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know more about that actually we see the european commemorations quite rightly and and keir starmer is the first british prime minister to attend remembrance commemorations in france uh since winston churchill uh, can someone get a quick message to him don't come home early what, like the last fella whatever you do don't come home early that would be a disaster but what happens in in um india I don't. I honestly don't know. I don't think Saqib did either. Either it's time for you to tell me. It's eleven forty-seven. James O'Brien on LBC. It's ten to twelve. When did Armistice Day transmute into Remembrance Day? It was meant to remind us of the futility of warfare. Are you sure about that, James? I don't know that I, you might be. I, I, I just it's certainly thought-provoking. But the I, idea that we remember certainly the First World War. You would remember as an example of, of uh, well, lions led by donkeys being the figure of speech that best describes it. And the First World War poetry, of course, of your Rupert Brooks and your Wilfred Owens and your Siegfried Sassoon speaks to the horror of it. Second World War, profoundly different because it was essential. And I know, you know, uh, uh, there's no such thing as perfection in the human 
race or in, in, in human history, but it was pretty clearly a battle between good and evil, or, or mostly good and mostly evil. And I think that, as I've explained to you earlier, I think that colours a lot of the coverage of, of or a lot of the attitudes to war that we have. And I genuinely think it, it partly explains why some people apparently have kittens at the thought of using a day like today, and what better day could there possibly be? to remember the bad stuff that happens in the name of war as well as the good stuff and the bad stuff done by your own side, crucially, because there's not much point remembering exclusively the bad stuff done by the other side. But I think we ca I carried this well into teenage years, possibly beyond, partly because I went to the kind of school that teaches Byzantine history or Byzantine history. Literally, I'm not using Byzantine as a figure of speech to describe something very, very complicated. I literally studied, studied Byzantium and Charlemagne, the Carolingians, and the Merovingians. So I was one of those people who didn't have a very good grasp. So I carried my sort of emotional sense of, of the Brits being the force for good in the world um, much later in, into life than perhaps I would have done if I'd studied it more at, um, at school. And I think that's probably part of the problem. What do you mean you're going to remember the bad stuff we did? We are British. We ruled away. Well, what are you scared of? Reality? History? Knowledge? fairly well documented accounts through the ages of of what kind of administrations re re regimes and individuals are frightened of knowledge facts history 1153 is the time back to the poppy ben's in hemel hempstead ben what would you like to say uh good morning james Hello, um first time caller so i'm very nervous it's only me ben it's only <laughs> me <laughs> that's what i'm worried about <laughs> Go on, then. um i was explaining to the young lady I spoke to yeah. that I've worn a white poppy most of my life because my grandmother, who lost three brothers in the First World War, uh, was one of the founding members of the Peace Pledge Union. Gosh. I think uh, there's a lot um, of ignorance of the history, of the, and the headlines yeah. don't help when they stick the word decolonized in the headline. But the, yeah, jo the yeah. job of responsible journalists is, of course, to find out more about the history, which is yeah. why I'm glad you're here. And it was founded basically by war widows and female relations of war dead because they were completely kept away from the national remembrance of the cenotaph. And they objected to this and formed their own union, which wore a white poppy, Gosh. which is to commemorate all war dead, civilian and military. And... And to call for uh, peace. I mean, it's a pacifist movement as well yeah. moving forward. Yeah. You, 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 you said before, when, when did this antipathy start? Yes. People, it was in the 80s when Thatcher, on television, um, slagged off White Poppy. Did she and the really? White Poppy was, Yeah, she did. Oh, dear. Uh, because I was a driver on London Transport at the time. And on the counter, every... This time of the year, we had a try of red poppies and a try of white poppies. Right. And the next year, the white poppies disappeared. It's a renunciation of war. I renounce war. Yeah, yeah. It's part and of it as well. the celebration of the celebrations or the remembrance. Well, the fetishization of some of it, I think, Ben. It goes, it yeah. goes into some very weird and, and, and dark places. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the idea that anyone thinks they've got the right to tell your grandmother mourning her three dead brothers when and where and how she should commemorate them is it's it's actually quite hideous when you dig into it yeah 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 do you still wear um, one now do you do you wear I, one now? yeah yeah i wear one yes and do you ever get any jip i did this year only this year um i, I will add when i go to my local supermarket yes um, they sell poppies in the foyer and i always put money in the tin of course and always politely reject the poppy. Yes. And I've never had any any blowback from the British Legion no. guys. Well, as wouldn't. I turned as I turned away, this couple in their thirties started having a pop at me verbally. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, <laughs> you start, you I, get used to it. <laughs> you do, but it's pretty shocking, isn't it? The, 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 yeah, the idea yeah. that they've they've some someone's given them the impression that they're entitled to. Yeah, publicly yeah. berate you for commemorating well, not just the fallen, but specifically, in your case, family members. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the Peace Break Union, it, it commemorates the uh, conscientious objectors who died, it, it, the, the, the men who were executed 
but having shell shock. Yeah. Um, I had the wish. Well, Can't we do it on a different day? Oh, what a strange thing to say in the context yeah, of what you're be, telling us. Be, because the Peace Pledge Union hold their own service in, um, I think it might be Russell Square, right. where the... Um, uh, the um, memorial to the conscientious objectors is held. I'm so fascinated it, by it, them. It, it, I'm fascinated it, by conscientious objectors because the courage, in a way, that it would have taken, and not in a way, it's just a different kind of courage to, to become a pariah, to, yeah. to be ex, I mean, often by your own family. There's a film, isn't there, The Four Feathers, I think, uh, that, that I yeah, must have watched yeah, it at yeah. quite a young age. And, and it, it always made me think that these people aren't cowards. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well, I think, having thought, and I do think about the First World War, I, I think about all wars a lot, yes. and I believe that in the First World War I would have been a conscientious objector, but in the Second World War I wouldn't, because of the reasons you said before. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's a, there's a logic to that. I bet we wouldn't, though. I bet we'd have gone to the First World War, because uh, we wouldn't have had the luxury yeah. of, of, of stopping, we might not have had the education, yeah. we wouldn't have had the luxury of stopping to think about it. And once all yeah. your mates oh. signed up... Once all your mates signed up, you'd probably sign up yourself. I'd also add that when the Peace Pledge Union came into existence... I've lost my train of thought now. That's all right, you've played a Um, blinder, Ben. I don't know what you were nervous about. It's, um... Yeah, I've I've just wanted to make a comment. You take care. Um, I'm go- and you and you too and thank you for that it was, it was really helpful actually and hopefully if anything comes away from this entire conversation people might take a moment to actually learn about why people like Ben's grandmother um, went to the uh, a, a trouble if you like of, of founding something that probably is being today uh, as you heard has happened to him in the supermarket very ignorantly and unfairly maligned although our conversation is not about the specifics of any of this it's about why some people hate freedom on this occasion, your freedom to do whatever you want with regard to a poppy. Last word on this to Ash, who's on the Wirral. Ash, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello, um, mate. I'd just like to say, you know, I'm, I'm an ex-serving uh, British commando and I've been to Afghanistan and I wear my poppy for my own personal reasons. Yes. Um, I guess I've got no problem with what poppies people wear, whether they choose to wear one at all, because at the end of the day, we sacrificed our our friends you know we've made sacrifices ourselves that we still live with so they can do essentially whatever they want in the name of freedom i guess yes and um, also you don't know the contents of someone's heart either mm. or you like like ben said he might have dropped 10 quid into the pot but he just doesn't want to wear the red poppy today it's just it's, yeah it is odd isn't it when did it start when did do you do you know when it because he said the 80s i don't like leading all roads to thatcher but given where you're calling from you might join in with that sentiment i don't know (laughs) when do you think it started using the poppy as a weapon with which to try to hurt other people on days like today yeah i think just as the nations grew further and further apart we've lost that social Mm. identity theory that probably was there during times of war when people have to come together um yeah, I think, I think everyone's trying to get make their own identity, make their own case, and everyone's operating to their own tune, I guess. And, and looking, for oppor- looking for opportunities to, to get, make a bit of attention or whatever it is you pursue by criticising yeah. other people's choices. When you wear it, what do you think of? I, I'm not being um, soppy. I just noted about 40 minutes ago that we don't... We, we do, I mean, it, for you, it's quite a solemn thing, is it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean... Probably about like my, my friends and that from you know in the past and, and even the ones who are still alive yes. who are suffering with with their own mental health and, and and injuries and so on and so forth. So yeah, it is. It's 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 quite a raw day, I guess, for me. And and that is also a timely reminder, thanks to you, Ash, of the three hundred and sixty four days of the year where possibly we don't do enough remembering about the people who did come back and are still with us and who don't get the support and the care that they deserve. Thank you, Ash. It's uh, twelve noon. James O'Brien on LBC. It is five minutes after 12. I do love you. You, I, you educate me every day. I, I did not know this story, Sam, and I, I just looked it up a bit during the news. Um, this is an extraordinary, uh, just a postscript to the conversation we've just had about poppies and commemorations and, and people and freedom. James Edmonds Sears was a captain in the Royal Army Service Corps during World War I. His address on discharge from the army was Cozy Cot, Outward Common Road, Billericay in Essex. 
1933, James Sears became well known when he appeared in Bow Street Court. He was charged with damaging a wreath. He had removed a wreath from the cenotaph and thrown it into the Thames. His action was because it was placed there by an emissary of Herr Hitler, Dr. Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg had earlier publicly justified the harsh measures taken by the Nazi government against communists and Jews. The German newspaper Berliner Tageblatt expressed astonishment that Captain Sears had only been fined for this behaviour. He believed, not without cause, that a similar act in Germany would have been treated more severely. The Sunderland Echo of the 11th of May 1933 reported on Captain Sears' trial for this offence in which he explained that he had served throughout World War I, which he had entered as a private aged 40 and had risen to the rank of captain. He held the Mons Star and was chairman of the Elsham branch of the British Legion. He explained that his actions were, quote, a deliberate national protest against the desecration of our national war memorial by the placing on it of a wreath by Hitler's emissary he was 59 years old when he did that <laughs> just just nuance complication facts and history uh, and and thank you to sam who reminds us that it would actually have been adorned with swastikas at the time that wreath from the um uh era from, from the, the german administration at the time six minutes after 12 and last word on this i quite like this from jill it ties in with what ben was telling us about his unfortunate experiences in the supermarket thank you for this james mike was brilliant that was our first caller i think i noticed this letter in the guardian yesterday from my old boss i always used to wear a white poppy for peace alongside a red poppy so that i wouldn't get assaulted for wearing the white one i like that that's, that's, a, that's a good old english a good old british compromise Seven minutes after 12 is the time. Right, oh, I should give you this quickly because I've got another one for you. Uh, if you've st tuned in for the missing word round, this was one of my all-time favourites. Cambridge Council cuts may force blank from city centre. Cambridge Council cuts may force blank from city... Do you know what the answer is to this one? Do you know? Cows. C-O-W-A, cows. You've got that kind of common land thing going on in Cambridge that means that cows can graze on a... Uh, sort of uh, uh, greens, uh, grazing rights that date back to the Middle Ages along the banks of the River Cam. But the council has revealed that rescue... How much, oh, here's another quiz for you. How much do you think rescuing a distressed cow costs? Cambridge Council, every time it happens. Cambridge City Council currently provides an out-of-hours animal rescue service. Oh, it's not per cow. It's, it's for the entire service per year. Oh, we should have a whip round. We could cover this ourselves. We could raise this money by... How much do you think it costs per year to provide an out-of-hours animal rescue service to help cows that fall into the river? I'll tell you later. I've got another missing word round for you as well, but we should probably get our next conversation up and running first. And it is a conversation that speaks to... I tell you, it's, it's the thing I find enduringly and eternally fascinating snobbery class and this country edinburgh university has warned students from privileged backgrounds not to be snobs to state educated peers i think this is a wonderful story because it acknowledges something that historically beneficiaries of the system have been very reluctant to acknowledge it acknowledges there's a couple of lines in it that are actually brilliant Scottish edition of the Sunday Times had the story chapter and verse, talked about the Scottish Social Mobility Society, which would complain that lecturers and students regularly mocked and mimicked individuals from north of the border. So you've got a kind of anti-Scottish snobbery kicking in here, but it's um, more in the first instance about snobbery being directed at state-educated peers. Um, it's about a campus where children children students from poorer backgrounds are and i quote inadvertently or deliberately shamed by more privileged students um it speaks of not knowing regional accents a lack of knowledge of regional accents it speaks of um this is really interesting to me uh inheritance tax we were discussing inheritance tax in class and people have explicitly said that they have more money because they just worked harder another had been told you can't be working class because you're at university that myth that wealth is a reward for merit whether it's hard work or or, or particular talent there are exceptions to this how many times do we have to uh 
How many times do we have to invoke Lord Sugar? <laughs> and there's lots of other people as well, but not that many. That's the point. The best way to become the possessor and the most popular way of becoming the possessor of an enormous fortune is to inherit it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, it's, you know, and it, uh, nothing wrong with wanting to pass stuff on to your children either. But the idea that third, fourth, fifth generation are somehow deserving of their wealth, deserving of their wealth compared to other. But all you've got to say is, Christ, I'm lucky. That's all you've got to do. Crikey, I'm lucky. That's it. Serendipity. Uh, swing of the wheel. What's it called? Not the swing of the wheel. The spin of the wheel. But they can't do it. And this is what the Edinburgh University thing um, highlights. We were discussing inheritance tax in class and people explicitly said, this is people who are 19, 20 years old, that they have more money because they have worked harder. I always think, find me an investment banker and find me a coal miner and tell me who works harder. You see? It's tricky. It's difficult. I've done the missing word round, Simon. So, unfortunately, you missed it. The answer was cows. There you go. You must have just, I don't know, stepped outside of the room for a moment. So, the, <sighs> the way into this, I think, is it's not from people like me is it we're, we're potentially the problem although i hope i wasn't when, when, when i was a student i do remember so the london school of economics was a strange place when i arrived there in the early 1990s it, it had a huge international constituent uh, loads of very largely very wealthy international students uh, a lot of children of diplomats but also a lot of children of plutocrats i, I mean there, were, there was a lot of money swilling around and obviously having been to public school i kind of knocked about with a lot of people in that category but there were not that many people there who'd been to schools like mine and so we kind of gravitated towards each other in the first couple of terms you know like kindred spirits and i don't think i really hope that there wasn't any snobbery attached to that but certainly gravitating towards each other who are a bit like you is, is probably an entry-level requirement for then moving on to snobbery or then looking down on others. But what I'm much more interested in is the... Uh, what I'm much more interested in is your encounter with the snobbery. I, I, the, the reason that I'm sounding a little bit stilted is because I don't want to defend snobbery. But I do want to use my experience and knowledge to explain that a lot of people behaving in the ways described in this article will be entirely unaware of how obnoxious their behaviour seems to you, or to me, or, crucially, to some of the students around them. There's a sort of quiet, a silent unquestioning about privilege that beneficiaries are... I was going to say groomed, but that's a, a, probably not a fair word in the current context. That they are conditioned from a very, very early age. Think about it. If you're going to start questioning whether you've got a right to what you've been born into, then the entire system is going to be threatened. What do you think would happen if Prince William woke up in the night every night going, I'm, do you know what? I'm not sure that I should have all these houses. I'm not sure we should be charging rent for the, uh, for the lifeboat stations down on the south. I'm not sure. You can't question it. If you question it, it all falls apart. And that's for the beneficiaries of it. For the rest of us, we are conditioned from a very early age not to question it. Doff cap, tug forelock, rich man in his castle, poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. So this isn't to defend, or this is to defend, this is not to excuse, it is simply to explain. So you get to university, and for the first time in your life, you encounter people from what I think we could loosely describe as a normal background. If, if this distinction, and Edinburgh, is, I think, has a, quite a high proportion of people who went to English public schools, but you get to university, and for the first time in your life, you are spending significant amounts of time with people who didn't go to fee-paying schools, or didn't go to boarding schools, or didn't go to public schools. It's the first time it's happened to you. And the reason why I think you behave in a way that some of the people you're encountering may find weird or obnoxious or rude or snobbish is because you don't know better. And the thing about not knowing better is it's excusable until you should know better, and then it becomes inexcusable or less excusable. I, I quite, Karen says, I remember being mocked for ordering a black cappuccino. <laughs> 
I, I've told you a few times, but this was at school, not at university, when the fact I'd never encountered an anchovy before became grounds for a, a remarkable campaign of, of teasing and, and, and abuse. So I pronounced it as you would if you've never encountered the word anchovy before, but you have encountered the word anchor. So you would pronounce it anchovy. But you know what kids are like. You know, at different schools, if you'd worn glasses or you'd had ginger hair or anything. But at my school, being common, at my school, being common was the thing that'd be desperate to find. Soccer. And I'm saying soccer to distinguish it from rugby football. If you liked football, when I started at my public school, you would get teased for it. Because only plebs, only plebs play football. By the time I left, I'm happy to report not only were everyone playing football in their spare time, but also Kid and Mr. Harry has had its own little miniature fan club among uh, some of the junior school. Well, me and some mates. Um, so, but football was, and, and uh, you know, pop stars. I put a picture of Madonna up on my wall and one of the big boys tore it down and called me a pleb. Pleb was a wonderful insult. Everyone was a pleb. This is early 80s at a public school in England. And, and the effort that was put, and most of us came from backgrounds where our parents were not posh. They were, you know, uh, not straining is a better word than struggling to send us to these schools. But that, that is my experience of snobbery. By the time I got to university, of course, I'm walking the walk and talking the talk and I've got anchovies coming out of my ears. Not literally, Keith. So what did it look like from the other side when you got to university and encountered people who'd never come across people like you before? What was your moment, your cappuccino moment? Matthias tells me that his wife... Um, it was at university with someone who complained that people shouldn't have pets if they can't afford a maid to look after their pet. That's Edinburgh University Business School for you. Good Lord. I, I, I mean, that, 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 so the thing that, how did someone prove to you that they had absolutely no clue what it was like growing up in the real world? And it doesn't have to be at university. It could have happened when you started at work. But the fact that Edinburgh University is going to the trouble of giving instructions to people. Here's some of the guidance for wealthier students. OK, when you meet new people, be curious about their interests and aspirations rather than their backgrounds. So that's a terrible thing that we do. I would say to you 20 years ago, if we met, if we met socially or even if we met at university, I said, where did you go to school? I told you what my friend Andy used to do with this because he ended up mixing in that kind of world. And they said, where did you go to school? And he'd say, I went to Alder Hill Comprehensive in Rochdale. Where did you go? And then, and then normally you do that because someone says, well, I went to b b b rugby. And you say, oh, well, you must know so-and-so. Or I think I know your sister's fan binky and bonky. And do -do 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 -do. And th that is what they mean by being interested in people's interests and aspirations rather than their backgrounds. It's the biggest code of the ruling class and even ruling class adjacent individuals is to exclude others, but they don't realize they're excluding you. And then two other points. Don't assume that everyone's life or family is like yours and try to undo some of the unhelpful mythology about the relationship of wealth to intelligence or hard work. And so I want you to tell me, 0345 6060 when you came up against people that need this sort of advice. Is that going to work as a question? I told you I was being stilted because I, I, I don't want to sound like a, I'm denying my own privilege, and B, I think that anybody who's engaged in this behaviour in the first term or the first two terms is by definition a wrong one. But what's it like to come up against someone who needs advice on this? So when the first time you went to a normal school and you sat in a room where everyone was talking about people they knew from schools that each other went, I mean, it's just so alien to me because I come from the other side of that fence, but it's a tiny side. There's 7% of the population on my side of the fence, and what we consider is perfectly normal sets the tone for an entire university. Because, I don't know, we've got the loudest voices or the biggest presences. What's it like when you realise these abnormal public school, privately educated people rule the world, or at least think they do? brackets and sadly still do close brackets 0345 6060 973 is the number you need listen i'll warn you now if i've got the question wrong i'll do another 10 minutes of monologue after this james o'brien on lbc i don't know what schools are like now uh, i like this from john calling people plebs is a bit common james someone from a posh public school i knew at university said that they called working people proles which of course comes from proletariat. I don't, I don't think there's a hierarchy of what is ruder or, or indeed more snobbish. My school, we, we use the word grockle, which I discovered many years later, is what people in Somerset, I think Somerset, call incomers. 
So I don't know what, how that became a synonym for snobbery at my school, but you would call people who had a regional accent. And what, what I'm, I'm highlighting, my parents had regional accents, is if you behave like that at school, and public schools can be terrible, and I don't think this has improved much, terrible petri dishes of snobbery, when you get to university and you actually encounter in the flesh the people about whom you've been conditioned to be so unthinkingly rude, it must be, well, things must happen. That's the point. So you go to these schools and you are, and the teachers join in. A complete demonization of people who go to state schools, a complete demonization of people who have regional accents, a complete demonization of people who are perceived as not being as wealthy as you are. And I think sometimes, certainly at my school, the kids who tried hardest were the ones who were most conscious of their own relatively humble backgrounds, the ones who really put the effort into this and really turned on the kids who arrived in the first year with a, with a bit of a, a Yorkshire twang or a Kidderminster accent. The ones that really put the boot in were not the ones who had moats around their homes. They were the ones who probably came from similar backgrounds and were very keen to keep the boot, the boot on the other foot. Um, so what's it like when you get to university and these two worlds collide? Sophie is in Edinburgh. Sophie, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. Uh, please forgive me. I'm a little bit nervous. It's only me. Um, well, I, and I've called in before, to be fair, on a similar topic. Okay. Um, but I'm actually a state ed- educated student uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Oh, um, so you're I'm, pretty well qualified on this one. Yeah, and I'm the former um, state educated students officer for the Classic Society because I, I, I remember our last season. conversation. I remember when we spoke before. I can't remember exactly. Oh, yeah. what, yes, but I do remember that. So you you know it of what I speak. Were you aware of the foundation of this organisation, this group, this advice that's been given to your fellow students? I'll admit I have I was not aware. No? Um, so I obviously I operate in the the other circles. Uh, with the 93 Club um, and things like that, yes. uh, which are more geared towards working class and state educated people. Um, but I've had my fair share of interactions that have gone slightly nastier than I'd have liked. Oh, have we lost the line? Hello? No, you're there. Sorry, go on. So, sorry, Sophie, I thought you'd finished. I thought you'd, I thought you'd dropped off us. I think you were just pausing for effect. So talk to me about what it's like from your background to encounter people like the ones being offered advice in these in these articles? So, for me, it was very much, this was more of a, an issue in the first and second years than, than in third and fourth, because I think by the time you've got to mine, because I am in a fourth year now, um, by the time you've got to that point, the people with whom you interact have had more interactions with people from state educated backgrounds and working class backgrounds yes. it's no longer their their first time but thinking back to first year you know there, there were a few interactions where you know i think it was my second lecture someone said to me you know where are you from you sound rough and i don't have a, a massively strong you, you use the accent. word rough rough Gosh. yeah yeah and it's, i don't have a, a, a massively strong accent but yeah it, it was it was the word rough and it really shook me out of the reverie <laughs> Um, I mean, it took me three months at university to um, meet someone else who went to state school. Did it really? Um, it did, because so 93% of students in the UK, as I'm sure you know, are state educated, um, whereas more like 65% of my university, depending on which year you look at, uh, is privately educated. So... So he thinks Actually, you're he thinks you're out of the ordinary, doesn't he? Because he's only ever knocked about with people like him. He's arrived at a university where the the, the pool has been diluted a bit, but he's still encountering mostly people like him. And he meets you, and he thinks it's perfectly normal to describe your accent as rough. He didn't. He wasn't exactly trying to be offensive. Thing, he wasn't trying to be offensive, and he probably didn't realise he was being offensive. No, because you, in effect, I am out of the ordinary because even though. <laughs> There are more of us in the country. There are less of us at the university. Yes. So we are the out of the ordinary. That's that's what we are. And as I say, when you get to this point in uni, you've found your people and they all have interacted with more people like me and, you know, other people who went to state school. But in that first interaction, there's, there's no way that, that he'd have known what he was saying. And so you're being quite generous to them. You're recognising that this is a consequence of their upbringing and not something that they could have done a great deal about. Well, in effect, I had the same thing, but from the the opposite direction. You know, oh, I yes. had that same 
lack of knowledge and lack of knowing how to interact with these people. But from the other direction, I didn't know how to interact with someone who owned horses and went to fancy <laughs> schools and had been learning. You know, I'm a classicist and some of my friends have been learning ancient Greek since I were 11. Yeah. I haven't had that. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I, I did nearly drop out of university in first year because I, I didn't know how to handle it because it's so difficult to exist in an environment that you you just weren't socialized for that's brilliantly put well can you remember when you felt i'm going to be all right can you remember was there a moment or did you just realize at some point or realizing now there must have been a moment but you didn't notice it at the time where you thought no actually I, uh, not not in a political way but in a in i've got as much right to be here as anybody else has this is going to sound completely ridiculous but <laughs> it's, it's the genuine truth I'm a bit of a musical nerd, yes. and I was listening to Legally Blonde, the musical. Yes. And there is a, a song in that called Chip on Your Shoulder, and it's basically comparing the life of someone super privileged right. with the life of someone from a more normal background and just talking about the chip that you have on your shoulder yeah. when you come from that kind of background just a, just a normal background of course no, i know it's not like you were you know a fork in the sugar bowl and down pit till tea time or anything like that it's, it's just a exactly. normal uh, this is the point i was trying to convey that's normal you're normal we're not you are <laughs> i have a very 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 just like normal yes. background the most regular upbringing you can imagine yes. and so what was the lyric listening it was um Oh, well, to, be, to be honest, it's the whole song. Is it? Um, and I remember there was a moment I was walking to uni and I was listening to that song and, and it was talking about you get a desire to prove yourself when you're amongst the elite right. and people that you don't understand, but you're, you've been given an opportunity. That was the big thing for me is I had to, I had to get over it and recognise that I had an opportunity here to have an incredible education yeah. and study a subject that i love i mean i love classics and it right. is a very elite subject i mean my degree be, title is. is the same as boris johnson's yes. like the, the name of my degree is the same that's the kind of people who have been, <laughs> who have been well i hope not i think he's from, a bit of a one-off he's a bit of a one-off but you're right you did very rare for people to have studied classics uh, for, for, from an early age unless they went to and i was lucky Yes. I was very and That's the bit I remember from our last conversation. But I, I'm a bit late for the news, or I'm about to be late for the news. So I, for briefly, if you can, the bit about this relationship between um, the, the mythology about the relationship of wealth to intelligence or hard work, that that is another element of this, isn't it? That people genuinely believe that the, the privilege or, or, or the luck that you describe is a consequence of meritocracy or effort. It's preposterous. I mean, it, it's, it's <laughs> so you just... sound like Boris Johnson now. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, and that is. Do bear with me. My roommate's from Oxford, okay. um, but it is completely ridiculous. You know, some people work really hard and they manage to rise and they manage to earn money and put their kids through expensive schools and things like that. Other people work really hard and don't get that if you if you're born with a golden ticket, then that is fantastic for you. But yeah. it's not down to necessarily hard work sometimes it might be but sometimes it's just down to an accident of birth yes well usually it is i mean certainly in the in the environments you're describing if everyone had started equal uh, i mean literally equal same school same background same level of parental care same um educational inputs then they would not have ended up where they've ended up uh we i should say to be clear would not have ended up where we have ended up so if you thanks i love talking to you i look forward to the next time here's amelia cox with your headlines james o'brien on lbc 12.32 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, they, 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 listen, I know James makes a good point in Folkestone. It's not exclusive to the upper classes. The kind of snobbery we're talking about here is, James, but I, I'll read your message because it's helpful. There are snobs in all levels of society if you're wearing the wrong trainers at school. People are going to criticise you even if that school is in a working class area. I couldn't tell the difference being uh, working class. You miss all the nuances. I'd be sitting having my lunch and someone asked me if I wanted hummus and I didn't know what hummus was. I was 24 at the time. And of course, it's geographical as well, because if you'd been in the Middle East, um, you, there's no earthly way you could have reached the age of 24 without knowing what, what hummus was. But this is about something more than that. This is about this. I thought Sophie was brilliant at highlighting the disproportionality of the conversation. The numbers are nuts. 
you 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 grow up in an environment where you are in a a, a small cabal of privilege and think that that is normal. Um, one or two of you unhappy with the use of the word normal, so I I and I understand why, but. I simply mean the the majority experience. Uh, what would be a better word than normal in that context? That's not a rhetorical question. I honestly don't know. The that the, you know you come from a seven percent background and you arrive at university thinking that everybody's like you, and for the first time in your life you meet people who are not, and and there is a clash of cultures, and it is very interesting, especially to people like me. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need. Um, my cappuccino moment. This from Simon. Happened on the first morning at breakfast. We're sitting in the ancient dining halls. I got into Oxford from my northern comprehensive in the late 1970s. I was eating my cereals, looked down the long line of fellow students. Every one of them was holding their bowl pointed away from their, uh, from them. I later understood this was how their public schools ensured they didn't spill any food on themselves. They did it with food normally, not Frosties, Simon. But yeah, your point is absolutely right. It's such a little thing, but my bowl was slanted towards myself and I suddenly thought this is such an alien world. Nobody commented. They didn't need to. Their expressions said it all. Um, And I I get to the end of this one as well because it's worth it. The the idea of using your otherness to your benefit. Um, I used mine to my benefit, but I totally understand why other people may be very intimidated by the experience. Average. Thank you, Evelina. I say average, not normal. There we go. That's problem solved. I don't ask you these questions for fun. I ask you um, usual, uh, better than normal. Well, hey, I'm going to go for average. Luna is also in Edinburgh. Luna, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a bit anxious for my first time calling. but It's um, only me. Yeah, I... <laughs> I mean, I was I was actually surprised to to hear this because I had no idea that you know. <laughs> just, that, you know I'm sitting in a studio in London, educating Edinburgh University students on stuff that's going on at Edinburgh University. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, yeah. but it can't be good. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I suppose it's just because I, I think I sort of. Um, I mean, I think I, I just sort of really do my own thing most of the time, really. Okay. Um, so. I, I mean, there's there's always a lot of there's always a lot of debate about everything at, at, at end. So, um, but yeah, I just um, I just think this discussion is quite fascinating because I think coming from you know uh, background, well, I'm from Malaysia, okay. and so um, you know, and I study English literature and classics, which also essentially attracts um you know, sort of <laughs> traditionally yes. what you would expect sort of to be snobbish type. It's going to be a was... more disproportionate student spread than there would be on other courses. Yeah. And I started um, because where I'm from in Malaysia, you know, like sort of Latin and Greek isn't even a thing that is taught to us. Right. So I had to do, you know, I began studying ancient Greek at a beginner's level in first year. Um, And I was definitely intimidated. And at first I did find that, you know, there were certain sort of, you know, you know, I think there was a bit of uh, resentment on my part, but um, I've always kind of, in a way, gotten over it. Yes, of course. Because I I think that at the end of the day, I think that, well, it seems to me that it's really about the amount of work that you do put in um, and sort of. Um, I do find that it's a bit difficult because, you know, there are some people who are in beginner's Greek who have at least been doing Latin since they were, like, five. Um, so, so, I mean, this is more a, a form of academic... Do you see, as, a, as, a, as an outsider, arriving here and becoming an insider, as it were, or watching the, the, the interplay between the classes, do you, as opposed to simply having the academic experience, the, the way that people dress or the way that people... Uh, the best example I can think of is is the absurdity to someone who's not from this background of asking someone else where mm. they went to school, as if as oh, if yeah. you're going to find common ground. Yes, and and this actually happened. Uh, this actually happened to a flatmate of mine in first year. Um, she actually had to move from catered halls to um, self catered because she said that for the first time she really kind of it really really affected her mental health and. Oh. Because she's from Rwanda, and um, she was sitting in um, the sort of dining halls, and yeah. then you know she was trying to make friends, and then all of a sudden someone comes up and asks her, you know, where did you go to school? And she didn't understand the question yeah. because she, in her head, it was like, well, 
how would you know? Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was, you wouldn't yes. know it till I went to, you know. So it seems like a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a strange thing of to course, ask. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, I had my own experiences in. Uh, I went to a private college in Malaysia, but I, you know, previous I went to um, a state school. But you know, I did have sort of you know this one person who would sort of just asked, you know, like what does who's your dad? Right. Like, oh wow. <laughs> you know, like, like who is your you know like it's a big thing in in Malaysia where you know if you are sort of among the yeah. wealthier Elite. backgrounds, yeah, you would like sort that of word, assume it's, it's, that everybody. Would have you a know. job that is uh, you're capable of describing a somebody job, as it were, or a high status, a yeah. presumption, a presumption that everybody is from the same background as you. I mean, that that yeah. can happen anywhere. Just out of curiosity, it's not relevant to the conversation that we're having. But where did your enthusiasm for the classics come from? Oh, that's a good question. I it came from English literature actually, and really? then also when I was about. Um, I think I was maybe about 18 or so, and I picked up a book on ancient rhetoric, and I decided that, you know, um, this was something that I was quite interested in. Um, but I absolutely love it. And, you know, to me, I think that, um, yeah, I think that I don't really, I mean, I, I try not to sort of, sometimes it can be a bit intimidating, I think, you know, socially. Yes, well, I'd, I'd ignored you completely in my introduction. I hadn't even thought about people who are coming in from, you know, <laughs> o overseas. And because and, and, at my university, uh, quite a lot of the overseas students were for, from such privileged and wealthy backgrounds that they created almost a subset of, 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 the, um, of the elite, a subset of the high status oh, yeah. where they only really yeah. mix with each other. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I do. I do notice that, you know, I think I think there is a tendency for Malaysian students to also be rather insular sometimes and, and not really mix. Um, and I think uh, it's it, it, I think well, the discussion is quite where, interesting where you feel safe and where you feel secure. I had two Malaysian flatmates in my first year at the London School of Economics, but uh, the, I'd forgotten that completely because largely because they, they weren't particularly interested in knocking about with, with the rest of us, but they're very good mates with each other. Luna, thank you. I, 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 that's fascinating. I, I love that line, that throwaway line that Luna used. I picked up a book on ancient rhetoric when I was 18 and now I'm studying Greek at, 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 at Edinburgh University. 12.41 is the time. Brian's in Wigan. I am an emeritus professor uh, now, which means he's retired, essentially. So I, I spent a career at the highest level in the pharmaceutical in industry, James. I was invited to a dinner in a hall in Cambridge. One of the dons asked me, what school did you attend? I was met with silence when I answered, Park Hall Compre Comprehensive, and it was a great school. Th this is the best example. I hope I'm communicating it to you because it's the best example of what I'm talking about. It's this something that is simultaneously incredibly divisive and completely normal. Com I mean, beyond normal. You, you show me somebody. So I, I, I had Dan Snow on Full Disclosure recently. I, I could easily have found three or four connections. We're of a similar age, similar schools. We would know people. We would know people that knew people that knew people. And you don't do it so much now because I'm in my 50s. But when you were in your 20s, when you arrived at university, you're desperately searching for a connection. It's a bit like saying, which I also do, what football team do you support? But when you find out what football team someone supports, you have a conversational common ground. You can talk about football, but you don't have a social common ground. You can't talk about fellow fans or, or you know, you don't say, who do you support? I say, well, there's nothing in Forest. He said, oh, well, you must know Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Five guy, you must know Johnny Toothbrush. Then they go. You don't do that if it's football, but it's searching for the conversational common ground. But no one is really going to feel particularly excluded by the football version of this conversation. What football team do you support? I don't really like football at all, frankly, and, and that might mean that the conversation dips a bit. But you don't feel judged. You don't feel that you've been placed in a social hierarchy. Say, so what school did you go to? To an emeritus professor of. Of, 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 I presume, some a, a science, Brian, and they're still doing it now. And you answer, oh, I went to, you know, um, Mallory Towers. And they go, oh, well, you must know Keith. Then, oh, old Keith. He was the, the, the scourge of the upper fair, the scourge of the lower remove. I remember Keith on the rugby pitch. It was like watching Moses part the Red Sea. And it just is normal for them. But if you're not from that background and you arrive there and you went to, for example, Park Hall Comprehensive or Hagley High, or wherever it may be, 
we have no idea how alienating our conversation is because it's a conversation that we've had several billion times in the course of our lives i've got another i should do this quickly i was going to save it for tomorrow but if i try and save things for tomorrow i always 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 forget them this is this is this is a particular cracker um it's a missing word round are you ready for this I, I've done that one. I've done the. I've done. Oh, the cow cost eight to ten thousand pounds. It costs to keep the out of hours cow rescue service on the ground in Cambridge. So I guess in office hours, you've got people that are doing it. But out of hours, depending on how many cows fall into the River Cam in the course of a year, it's going to cost between eight or ten thousand pounds. And as a consequence of cuts that Cambridge Council are contemplating, I told you it was an alliteration friendly story. As a consequence of Cambridge Council cuts contemplated currently. <laughs> Oh, I got another two at the end of that one. Cows, cow rescue service could be compromised in Cambridge because they will save eight to ten thousand pounds by. And then, of course, if they can't rescue the cows that fall into the cam, they can't have the cows in the environs of the cam. They will have to get rid of the cows. So that is why council cuts in Cambridge could spell curtains. <laughs> curtains <laughs> for cows. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.47. I'll save this. Should I save this one for tomorrow? We've done quite a lot today with the cows. I'll probably forget. Shall I do it now? And then forget before? I'll do it now. Okay. I lost nine. This isn't the headline I wanted. The headline I wanted was sli was slightly different, but I'll take this. No, we got the other one. It was a bit better phrased. It was a bit better phrased, the other one. Stress on the set or so something like that. Just bear with me. You should probably do this stuff off air, but you're used to me by now. If you're expecting professionalism and fluency, you've come to the wrong place. We're doing missing word rounds with headlines that we've lost. This is, this is all the greats. There we go. Yeah, this is the one I wanted. No, that's the same one. Anyway, don't worry. Yeah, I know it's the biggest show on the stage. It's a bloody miracle, Keith, frankly, isn't it? It can't last. 12.48 is the time. I lost nine blank filming Squid Game. Says director of Squid Game. Squid Game. I lost nine blank filming Squid Game. BBC on set with show's director. So the director of Squid Game was given an interview to the BBC in which he revealed he was so stressed that he lost nine what? But yeah, I, I just, it, it wasn't, the headline was different when I found it earlier. And it, 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 anyway, now you know, all right? I lost nine blank filming squid game it hasn't got stress in the headline and stress was in the original headline but you know what it's like with news sites online when i print them out i've got a message on my screen from the producer do you know what it says it says that's your printout i got it out of the bin this is a bit like in the wizard of oz when toto pulls the curtain back and you discover that the great and powerful oz is actually just a slightly ridiculous old man um, messing around with bells and whistles. I got it out of the bin. Do you, I, I bet Michelle Hussain doesn't have people sending her messages while she's trying to present the Today programme, telling her that they just got something out of the bin. Not only you brought it into the studio, so what if it had some of Nick Ferrari's breakfast left on it or something like a bit of egg yolk or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, uh, Alexis is in Brixton. Alexis, what made you pick up the phone on this subject, if you can remember, after that unforgivable... Um, uh, move away from the central theme. What's on your mind? Hi, James. Hello. I'll try. Thank you. Um, so this, I'm coming at this from quite a different perspective. I grew up in the U.S. Right. Uh, where I think class is more associated with wealth yeah. and can be a lot more volatile. Um, I grew up yeah. in a very working class, very diverse neighborhood in in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. Um, my parents were immigrants. My dad worked three jobs to send me to school. Um, and when I entered university, I, I actually wound up getting into a very prestigious university in the U.S. Okay. And my parents really wanted me to go there because they wanted me to have or gain the, the title um, from the degree I got. Yes. And to make those social connections. Um. For me, when I got there, it was like landing on an alien planet. Yeah. I was working to uh, make money uh, while I was studying. I earned about $80 a week. Right. And my peers, we were all doing um, a pre-medical degree. Gosh. So That's my a lot peers of work. Were a lot of work. So much work. And um, my peers were in the same classes as me, but they were able to 
you know, go out partying on uh, every night. Um, we're, we're constantly just on the move. And I had no idea how I could be studying so hard, working, and uh, not earning the the grades I needed okay. to really uh, do well. I, and then you looked around at people who didn't seem to be working as hard as you, but were getting the grades. Exactly. Yeah. And, and That's I like an anxiety school. dream, isn't it, almost? <laughs> I still have anxiety dreams. <laughs> oh, we all have anxiety dreams, Alexis. It just depends what flavour. But that is <laughs> as if you're trying running as fast as you can and people keep going past you who don't seem to be exerting themselves at all. Totally. And it, it turns out what they were doing was... Um, now, the people I was going to school with yeah. were sons and daughters of senators and heads of hospitals and... They were actually taking the classes at university, but in the summer, they would take summer classes that would then replace their uh, their term grades. Oh, wow. So their parents were able to pay for them to go to summer school in these shorter um, programs at community colleges near home, and uh, that grade would just be overwritten on their university degree. So they, they got to kind of have a really great university the, the, this is This is the vocabulary almost of privilege that, that, <laughs> that you'd never been taught. I mean, regardless of whether you had the money to do it or not, the fact that you didn't even know that the option exists. Exactly. That's extraordinary, isn't it? I had no idea that I could do that. And I, I found out quite late in my second or third year. Oh, of whoa, gosh. That, sorry, that sound effect, I should explain. That was like, I can't believe it took that long because you must have just been thinking, I mean, your self-esteem must have been chipped away at ever so slightly every single time that you had this feeling. Well, you say it a lot, actually, but, you know, um, I didn't have anyone in my family who had gone to university before. So I didn't know how to go to university. Yeah. I didn't know how to ask for help. I didn't know what any of the loopholes were so we were just starting on uneven ground yeah completely and 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 you can't really ask anyone for help can you really i don't think unless you know who to go to and who would that be (laughs) so how did did things pan out i i I, I don't like to leave stories unfinished you pushed through you've ended up in brixton I, I, you know what, doesn't it speak to, I, I found a place that I feel very much at home here in London, and I'm actually pursuing a veterinary degree now here in the UK. Fantastic. Yeah. So what, how far into your pre-med did you go? Oh, I, um, I wound up leaving that in my third year okay. because I was just struggling. And now we know, and now, and now you know why, and now you know yeah. why, but everything's coming up roses. Yeah, it is. I love it. Thank you, Alexis. I, Thank I, I, you. And you're so right about that, Mary. I'd need you to present the show, and I'd ring in on the on the American angle on this because I know you've still got wasp and and Mayflower fetishization and all the rest of it. But yeah, the the the, the it's less opaque uh, the relationship between wealth and privilege. Here, you can have someone who will look down their nose at you despite not having a pot to pee in. Um, because of the nature of, of really deeply embedded royal family level class systems, but uh, the, the but the problems remain very much the same. I love that phrase, the vocabulary of privilege. I don't think I've heard that before. That the idea that you just uh, don't speak the language. No one's taught you the words that you use. You didn't know about summer school options. You had no idea that anchovy was not pronounced like anchor. You thought that a black cappuccino was a black coffee. I just did kind of casual casual um knowledge social knowledge uh last word on this oh this is ridiculous you've made up this name so i don't know if you heard my attempt to introduce alliteration into every word that i used shortly before the last break when i talked about cambridge council cuts compelling cambridge council to cut cow conservation on the river cam i've got a caller now claiming to be called cab in cambridge that is my name, and that is where I am. So you should have done an hour on the cow story, man. That would be solid gold. That's Alan Park is to the extreme. Well, hang on. Mike's cross. He says, I think you're missing the point with the Cambridge cows. It's just like the VAT on private schools, where those with more than enough are bleating or mooing about having to pay a little bit more while the rest of the country remains on its knees. But you did not ring in cab in Cambridge to talk about cows on the cam. 
and the council being compelled to cut cow conservation. You talked, you rang in to talk about something else. What do you want to say? Yeah, I did. I did. The, what the last caller said rang quite a call with me, but actually my experience was was kind of hilariously different. I, I first turned up at university in 1992. It's just mm. to start the sort of cool Britannia region, the sort of fetish. Yeah, same as me, working, pretty much, give or the take. The working class. Yes. And, and I found in my first few weeks, because I, I I come from a sink estate in in, in Gateshead with a with a school which you're more likely to go to prison than to go to go to university. I think I was only six former from my my year who went straight to university. Gosh. And um and we, I found in my first week, I didn't think I had a strong accent, uh-huh. but none of the posh kids, by which I mean all the kids from from better state schools and private schools, they literally didn't understand me. So I had to speak very slowly and very carefully. And I sort of developed this mental idea that they were all a bit stupid <laughs> because they didn't really, they didn't really get what I was saying. And, yes. and, and what continued that on was you'd go to like a, a pub with them and you'd be talking to someone who worked at the university, and I'd just be talking to them like you know that's normal. Yeah. And they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They didn't, they, they, they couldn't talk to the cleaners and they couldn't talk to the pizza delivery people and they mm. couldn't talk to the people in the shop. They just didn't have that touch. I mean, they're, they're very well educated, all better A-level grades than me, but if you told them you could boil potatoes and carrots in a pan at the same time, it would blow their minds. They weren't, <laughs> they, they weren't equipped to deal with, 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 with ordinary life. And as I went on through that, into sort of 92, 93, 94, you, you find that, I mean, this is the era of Pope's Common People, where you've got yes, this huge fetishisation of the working class life. Yes. And they were sort of increasingly cosplaying as us. So you become a, a role model in, 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 instead for these people. Everyone wants well, to be more cab. Hardly that. But <laughs> it, it was it was just a very very strange period. But I would say, I mean, I went on to do a, do do a, do another degree at Nottingham afterwards, and I've worked at Cambridge University for years after that. It's got a lot harder for the kids because yeah. not only are they, yeah. they they're paying so very much, basically indebting themselves for life, mm. but that that coolness of working class thing is gone. And it's been replaced by a harder snobbery. And I've seen kids from my background really struggle. I'm glad you said that. I'm not glad it's true, but I'm glad you made that point because I think that was a bizarre window uh, in, yeah, in, yeah. in British culture and history when everybody kind of wanted to um, sound like Liam Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Cab. Uh, the, the answer is teeth. But what is the question? I lost nine teeth filming Squid Game. BBC on set with shows director. So the original headline, I, I, I lost nine teeth through stress. Teeth? I never knew. Anyway, we'll do it again tomorrow morning from 10. That is it from me for today. You can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio, as well as listen to a range of podcasts. So do download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Uh, Tom Sorbrick will be with you at four, but now on LBC, it's Sheila Fogarty. How do you lose teeth through stress? I mean, grinding or...? Right there. <laughs> Then do they just fall out? Your gums oh, soften yeah, through stress. stress. It killed off almost every cat. I don't know, spoiler alert. I don't know. I mean, anyway, doesn't we Doesn't say. No, doesn't say. say. You need a call from a dentist. Any dentists listening? I, don't, I, I think he must have been grinding his teeth. Yeah, probably. Or beating his head against a wall during the night through stress. Anyway, nine. <laughs> yes, not good. It's a lot of I hope teeth. they were all at the back. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> Onwards and upwards uh, with all my teeth. Uh, at three today, it's thought the government will offer a financial boost to hospices <clears throat> as employers' national insurance and wage increases threaten some's very existence. We'll hear from one Labour MP uh, whose city has just saved a children's hospital called Zoe's Place. Happens to be my city, Liverpool. At two, the scale of so-called catfishing carried out by Alexander McCartney, who was jailed recently for 20 years at least for his crime. Crimes, it's shocking. He had three and a half thousand victims at least. His crimes began when he was a schoolboy. Has this happened to you? Is it happening to you? But we'll start with Keir Starmer in Paris. Is Britain our piggy in the middle when it comes to Europe and America, or a vital bridge between the two? James O'Brien on LBC.